Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 at 4 p.m. We are a few minutes late. Thank you for your patience. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Bolston. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. Please stand for the pledge. Okay, so we're at agenda approval. Any additions, deletions, or substitutions? If not, none. Make a motion. Oh, wait a second, hold on. Mr. Moore? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember the one that we talked about? Yes, ma'am. You're referring to item 6G3 regarding the John Deere backhoe piece? Yes. 6G? 6GE. Oh. 6GE. I don't yes, think so. 6G3. 6G3. Oh, thank you. That's eating disorder. No. I think we've changed this. We vote reordered the agenda. So just a second, please. I marked it on the other one. It's the agenda item referring to the purchase of a John Deere 310 yes. SL backhoe loader you, from I Dobbs Equipment utilizing the Florida Sheriff's Association contract. Thank you. Uh, six. six. Yeah. The agenda's been updated from when we discussed, ma'am. Yep. Six. Did you want to pull that? Yes, discussion? please. Okay, discussion. So we're going to bring that Wherever to 7AA. 7 well, 6I3 will go to 7AA. Any others? Seeing none, entertain a motion as amended. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. All right. Moving on to presentations, we've got a um, Employee of the Year award. Ms. Lachey King. Lachey King, Human Resources Generalist. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Commission. How's everybody doing today? Well, we have a great presentation. So listen, usually I'm here to present our employee of the month. But today I get to announce our employee of the year. But before I get started, I want to read a few, few things on her nomination form. Did I say her? OK. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Since I began working for the city of Daray, Lauren has helped me immensely, even with matters outside of her normal responsibilities. Lauren always has a positive attitude and maintains herself in a professional manner while helping with processes and procedures. Lauren is always willing to share knowledge and procedures with our department and always lends a helping hand. She is welcoming to everyone who visits the finance department. Lauren understands the importance of teamwork, and she exemplifies this quality every day. And there's more. Lauren is the ultimate team player. No task is too big or small, and her approach to customer service is second to none. Lauren seeks out ways she can assist both finance staff and those from the other departments. She is knowledgeable on all city matters and historical knowledge is helpful when it comes to important past issues. Please help me celebrate our 2021 Employee of the Year, Lauren Sims. So if we can have Lauren come up and the Director of Finance and Purchasing and they're going to say a few words about Lauren. Uh, John Leggy, Finance Director. Uh, 
It's uh, an, an honor to work with Lauren. When I first came here about a year ago, uh, Lauren was the executive assistant in the finance department. And those words that, uh, that were read were very, very uh, you know, detailed. Everyone that walked into finance always received a good smile, and she knew everything about finance, probably way, way more than I did when I, when I started here on March 1st. So I was used her as a great resource to help me get through my first couple of weeks here and knowing where the bathroom was and to, how to get to different places and stuff. But I think the biggest thing for Lauren was, that not, was, was not only finance, it was throughout the whole entire city. She knew exactly somebody in every department and was able to reach out and help every department. So her, her uh, expertise, you know, served well beyond just the finance department for the entire city. Well deserved, and I'm proud of Lauren. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. So purchasing was very fortunate to snag Lauren from finance. Thank you. Um, Lauren is a true asset to the city as a whole. Uh, we appreciate you every single day. Thank you so much for being a part of the city team, the purchasing department team. We love you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So stay here because we have some goodies for you. So on behalf of the commission, the city of Delray Beach, and all of these people out here, we would like to present to you this beautiful plaque. Very nice. And show it to everyone. All right, very nice. And a certificate for 24 hours off with pay. That's pretty amazing. Yes. That is nice. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Lauren, did you want to say anything? Sure. More than welcome. <laughs> Just want to say thank you for this recognition. Um, I'll be with the city eight years this coming May, so looking forward to many more years to come. Thank well, you. I was going to say you have a lot more departments to serve, so we're going to have you here for a very long period of time. Thank you for everything you've done, thank and you congratulations. So well thank deserved. You. Alrighty then, moving on to uh, 4B, the presentation um, of the Delray Rocks, uh, recognition, I'm sorry, of Delray Rocks, and also the cheerleaders for their outstanding achievement. This will be Mr. Sam Mitot. Good afternoon again. Uh, Sam Mitot, Director of Parks and Recreation. Do they need to come in, the little guys? Yeah, we're going to get them all in here, but I want to introduce uh, Mr. Prentice Mobley, the Superintendent of Recreation, who oversees uh, all of our recreation programs out at the parks. Appreciate that, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Nancy Commission, Prentice. City Manager. Yes, he does. Yes. Oh, yeah. Would you say you like the tie? Yes. I said so fancy. Okay, appreciate it. Oh, appreciate I'm used it. to seeing you in the, the, you know, the Parks and Rec outfit, so this is really fancy. Oh, yeah, okay. All right now. All right. Oh, my gosh. Um, the saying is you, you haven't been hit till you got hit by a rock. <laughs> that is a, a saying that uh, goes out throughout the Dairy Rocks program. The Dairy Rocks program is responsible for molding youth, and, and, and providing mentorship through volunteers and coaches uh, for years and years, over 50 years in this community. And it has continued year in and year out to continue the legacy that was started many, many, many years ago and produce fine young men through football, through discipline, through family, through loyalty. And today we wanted to recognize both the young men and the young ladies uh, for their accomplishments this past season. I'm going to start off with the ladies first. Uh, our Dairy Rock cheerleaders, uh, led by um, one of our employees, Ms. Kim Phillips. Uh, they went on and had a competition at AYFL, and uh, all their age groups got first place. Uh, most of the age groups got first good. place, giving them grand champions. <laughs> Ms. Kim does a great job, like I said, mentoring the young ladies. It's a large group. Uh, of young ladies that come together, they do the routine, and they also are cheerleaders on the sideline for the football team during the season. Once the season's over, 
they practice and they compete at this competition, which we just spoke of. So shout out, congratulations to the Dairy Rocks cheerleaders on their grand champion. Go girls. Second, I'm going to speak on these young gentlemen, young men, young future leaders that's sitting uh, that's back here in the back with their jackets on. They are the 7U uh, Dairy Rocks. From the start of the season, well, let me go back just a little second. I remember a lot of them in our in what we have a diaper sports program where we was playing flag football, and a lot of them were participants just running around with no concept of the game. But here we are, a couple years later. Uh, Seven-year-olds, and they had an undefeated season from beginning Ooh. to end. <laughs> Their head coach, Eric Davis, along with his staff and our city staff, Coach Davis, <laughs> did an excellent job along with the coaching staff and really dedicating their time and effort to these young men. They're great young men, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen without the great coaches. The great volunteers and the parents are trusting us, uh, trusting their kids in our program to uh, get things done. So, like I said, they were undefeated champions, uh, 7U Super Bowl, AYFL. There are some pictures up here on the big screen. Put a little thing. They, if they run it, you will see a couple pictures. So, I don't know, Coach Davis, you want, you want to say a few words, Coach Davis? I'm going to bring up Coach Eric Davis. He's the head football coach of the 7U. Fantastic. Good afternoon, members of the commission, the mayor. Uh, thank you for having us. Well, what an incredible season. Remember, these are your Delray Rocks. This is the city of Delray. This is what we produce. This program has been around since the 1960s. I'm a product of the program. And uh, right now, I just retired as spokesman for Rick Bradshaw, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, but he brought me back. But I still have time for these young men in this city. This is my city that I love, and we want to make sure that you know that on the west side of Swinton, we're doing great things. Right. We're doing great things, and, you know, we're mentors as well as coaches, and we're, you know, there are a lot of different things going on in the families, so we're there to fill those gaps. And I want to say thank you for your support and continued support and, and having us here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to bring up uh, uh, Miss Kim Phillips. Uh, she's over the Dairy Rocks Chiliers. Thank you. Um, I would all, I'll also like to say that I am a product of Dairy Rocks too. I cheered for the Dairy Rocks. I coached for Dairy Rocks cheerleading, and now I am running the program. Um, I appreciate everything from the city of Delray because we have to keep our girls grounded and safe from the streets. Mm -hmm. um, this year I had a total of 90 cheerleaders. And um, three of my um, teams, which is my competition squad, went and um, performed at the AYFLC cheerleading competition. And um, they all came in as grand champions, all three teams. Fantastic. So thank you for your support and everything you do for our girls and our kids and our program. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to end it by saying congratulations to our 7U Super Bowl champs and our cheerleaders, grand champions, for doing a great job. Thank you so much, Prentice, and uh, job well done, fellas. This was a great season for you, and we're so proud, and uh, you make Del Rey proud. So thank you for everything you've done, and to the cheerleading squad as well. I, I, obviously, they're not here. I, I, okay. Well, please send, uh, send the same to them. We're very, very proud of, of what they're um, doing and their achievement for this year. We appreciate everything that you are doing and also for the coaches for our, our, um, our, our children in this town. So thank you so much. Anyone else want to say something? Yes. Yeah, I would just like to say that uh, this was the first time I saw Delray Rocks on my calendar, and I was really happy. And that's because when I was a kid and saw Delray Rocks on the calendar, that means I was playing them that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and it was going to be rough. <laughs> um, but now I get to go out to the practice fields, and I know why it was rough. It's because of how hard you guys are working out there. 
and uh, you're putting in the time and you're doing it right. And uh, it's so exciting to have you guys here today and congratulations. Thank you. Good. Yeah, and I would just like to say, I can't see you. Where's Mr. Davis? Hello, Mr. Davis. You're so lovely and I know, you know, we've spoken and I know what you do is so much more beyond coaching for these children and I can't tell you how much we as a city really appreciate people like you stepping up and mentoring kids who really need a role model and plus they're having so much fun and they're doing so well and I can't thank you enough for your contribution to our city. Thank you. Thank you guys. Vice Mayor would like to yes, say something. Just one last thing. Uh, it's so wonderful because we know the program's working because the coach and the cheerleading coach are here and they're champions with the young, the next, next generation. I'm sure there have been some in between, right? Hmm. So <laughs> congratulations and thank you for coming back, giving, giving back. Thank you. Thank you. What a great way to start a meeting. What a great way to start a meeting. Did you, did they want to do a photo? Bring them all up. All right, guys, come on up. You can stand up behind them. We love to do a photo. Coaching here, too, and Prentice. Congratulations. Hi, guys. I nice. love your jackets. I love them. Yeah, cha cha champion. Love it. Got a picture here, guys. And you want to come around so you can get in? Come, come, come. I don't know if you can get everybody. Let us know if you can get everybody or you can't. Okay. All right, crazy photo, guys. One, two, three. Crazy. crazy. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, guys. I know. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right, moving on. We are now at the uh, comments and inquiry section of the agenda. So we're going to start with the city manager uh, to respond to any um, prior public comments or inquiries. No prior public comments or, or inquiries at this point. Okay. Likewise, I would like to have us address the item relative to federal legislative priorities. Yep. And a couple months ago, authorization was granted to commission Color 9 Group for Federal Legislative Support Services. And since the commissioning of their, that organization, we've been working with all department directors to identify federal legislative opportunities that otherwise would not become possible. Likewise, we have from the Color 9 Group with us this afternoon, Mr. Michael Willis, who is here to briefly provide an update to the City Commission in terms of targeted goals and objectives to provide an opportunity for the City Commission to offer consensus to proceed accordingly as well. Mr. Michael Willis, if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioners and uh, Mayor, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you, uh, especially when it's 40 degrees in D.C. It's always nice to get down here where it's a little bit warmer. Um, I do want to say before I start today, I have, I've had a great opportunity to meet with your staff and really work through them on some of the priorities and projects that are taking place throughout the city. And I have to say, you have some of the best staff I've ever worked with. They know their issues. Uh, they know what they're doing. They communicate very well. Uh, and uh, we even had an incident where I needed information last Friday at 5 o'clock, which is not the optimal time to get information. And I had it within the hour. So it was wonderful. Your staff have done a great job of really helping us with that. Uh, I do want to, again, specifically, I just uh, I want to give a shout out to City Manager Moore, Assistant City Manager Oris, uh, D Director and Assistant Director of Utilities, Hassan and Juan and a Public Works Director, Missy Barletto. They've just been phenomenal to work with and have given me lots of information on uh, some of the priorities uh, that are there for the city. That said, I want to just kind of give you an overview today of some of the opportunities that uh, exist in 2022 for the city. This is sort of the year of infrastructure. 
Uh, for the last couple of years, uh, there's a joke in D.C. about infrastructure week. Uh, we're going to talk about infrastructure, we're going to get infrastructure funding, and then before you know it, a tweet went out or something would happen, and Monday morning we were no longer talking infrastructure. And so thankfully, um, this is the year of infrastructure. Local governments have finally have some pots of money uh, that they can go after to help partner uh, with uh, local and state funds uh, to leverage those funds to further along some of the important projects that exist. So I wanted to give you sort of an overview of three of those opportunities that exist this year that we'll be going after uh, for different uh, local priorities that you all have. And so one of those is the community funding projects request. You guys may remember earmarks from 10 years ago uh, that went away from members of Congress. Uh, in 2021, Congress, in a bipartisan way, decided that they no longer wanted to be fully hands-off on project selection and leaving all of that to the federal agencies. So they've gone back and said, we want to uh, select some projects for our, our local governments. And so uh, those will be taking place. Members will be selecting projects from local governments here in the next month or two. Uh, Representative Franco, of course, was here today touring uh, some of the projects and looking at her priorities that she really cares about here in the city. Uh, so it's good to see that, that she has an interest in the city and that she will be. I've already been assured by her, her staff has a very big interest in taking care of the city of Delray Beach. So that's really good. Uh, federal infrastructure grants or bipartisan infrastructure bill that was one of the things that was uh, just passed in November a 1.2 trillion dollar bill that will fund uh, surface transportation projects uh, throughout the country there's about 25 different competitive grant programs most of those already existed and I'll dig into those uh, just a little bit more in a minute uh, but those are going to be being released over the next few months uh, one of those is already opened uh, others will begin to roll out in the next few weeks to, to months and we should expect uh, most of those to be uh, projects to be selected and allocated for funding prior to October 1 of uh, 2022. So there's some good turnaround on, on funding on those projects in the next few months. Other federal grants that exist are the same kind of programs. There's been thousands of agencies, sub-agencies, and, and departments that release funding every year for different types of projects, things uh, such as FEMA and law enforcement grants and arts, those sorts of things. Those grants will continue to be released uh, over the year. There's not a set time period for when those open. Those do typically come out throughout the year as funds become available to the agencies. Uh, Congress has not passed the FY22 budget yet. When that budget year began October 1. They should pass that by March 1st, or excuse me, March 11th, and then the agencies will begin to dole out some of those funds from the grants for this year. Digging in a little bit deeper into uh, the different community uh, funding opportunities that exist, I mentioned the earmarks or appropriations. Uh, like I said, those will begin uh, in March, April. We'll be able to look at uh, types of um, projects that can be funded for that. Just for your awareness, typically an end earmark or a community funded project request would be somewhere between 500,000 to 4 million uh, for the federal portion of a project. So you'd be able to, uh, it, your project can be whatever size, but that's typically the size you're gonna get from a, a direct apportionment from Congress. Um, and projects what, that they're looking for typically need to begin that year. They don't, want to look, they don't want to allocate you funding and then start the project in three years. So it's typically good to have a project that's ready to go within the year. Uh, Timeline-wise, we're looking at, like I said, uh, submitting to the Congress uh, March, April. Congress will begin to look at the committee process. We'll begin to review all the requests and talk with the agencies, make sure it's a viable project sometime uh, June, July. And then House Senate reconciliation will begin after August recess in September and funding available sometime in 2023 uh, is when those uh, projects uh, you'll be able to receive money. Types of projects, uh, transportation, water, wastewater, FEMA, mitigation money, uh, law enforcement, arts, anything basically that's a local government need can be funded through these bills. It's just important to keep in mind if you're going after a federal grant, there's a possibility of getting 10 to 20 million when you're going directly after an earmark or a direct member apportionment, you're looking at 500,000 to 4 million. So leveraging the dollars in a, a smart way will be key for us as there's state dollars and other things available as well. The bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, as I mentioned, there's 25 different competitive grant opportunities available to local governments through this bill. Most of those already existed, uh, but some of them are new. There's a charging and fueling infrastructure grant that will be new in this bill uh, to help local governments that are looking for electric charging stations for electric vehicles. 
the, the RAISE grant or the former TIGER grant is being funded at a much higher level than it previously has been. Uh, that's really these types of uh, grants are for multimodal projects. Uh, and so those will be available. There's also Building Resilient Infrastructure Grant. That's a new one that's going to, to come into play here in the next few months. And then Flood Mitigation Assistance and Reconnecting Communities, which is broadband uh, funding. All of that will be made available in the next few months. And just to be aware, uh, for your awareness, a lot of the rules for the new programs aren't released yet, so we don't know exactly what those will look like in, until March or so. And that's when we should expect those. Uh, anticipated federal grants, again, uh, I think I said there's a thousand different grants that are released every year through the, the annual appropriations process through all the different agencies. Rather than tie your staff up with always chasing down a thousand different grants, uh, our, our, our company has uh, partnered with the, the feds and working with all of their agencies to sort of streamline everything into a database that we created and then it highlights for us the, the grant programs that match your local projects that are on the ground. And so every day we take a look at that, we see what, how we can match those, what best fits, and then we create fact sheets and then send them to staff as we see a match that might be beneficial to you. And so as those become available, we'll continue to send those to the city and make sure your staff are fully aware of those. Uh, examples, uh, FEMA pre-disaster mitigation, which the city has applied for uh, in the past, National Endowment of the Arts grants, uh, Community Policing grants, Save America Treasures, which is historic preservation. Uh, those are some of the examples of different grants that are available. And so currently, right now, the city has three grants that I'm aware of that are pending that we've been asked to sort of monitor and keep an eye on. Uh, there are hazard mitigation grants that were made available through some COVID relief funding. Uh, and so we're going to continue to monitor those. If funded, one of the things that we will help the city work with is making sure you receive the money in a timely and efficient way. Sometimes you can see money awarded and then for whatever reason, it could be months and months before it's actually on the ground to you. We'll try to help speed that process up if there's any hiccups. Uh, if for some reason the projects are not funded, we will go back to the agency and really work with the agency to find out where the hiccup was or where the, the process failed. The application didn't meet the standard they were looking for in that moment and we'll help re redo that for next time so that we can get funding through that program in the future. Okay. So I just, again, that's an overview of kind of things we're looking at over the next six months or so. Um, I'm willing to take any questions, anything you would have, I'd be open to. Can I just ask one? The uh, National Endowment for the Arts, I think I saw that on a slide with yes, said Our Town. What is that? The Our Town or National? Could you, if you slide the slide back, yeah, I'll tell you question. when I was looking at it. Yes, it's both. Yeah. Right. The Endowment of the Arts, Our Town Grant. Our Town Grant. Uh, that's an arts grant for, dis uh, I believe that's the displaying of art. Um, I'll have to go back and look at it specifically which one that one is through them. But National Endowment of Art does uh, provide funding for the display of programs that are significant artworks that are significant to the culture or history of a region or culture. Oh, nice. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I have a couple questions. Yes, um, so is your role as our lobbyist, federal lobbyist, is, is that basically what it is? is yes, ma'am. Okay, so does it, is it similar to our state lobbyist role where you're helping us to get grant dollars from the federal level versus what we're getting from the state level? It is, it looks very different, but it's very similar. In, in okay, and, and I'm just, uh, just trying to figure out, uh, you know, because one of the things that we didn't have a lobbyist for a very long period of time. We only started working with a state lobbyist since I've been here. Um, other, there might have been one prior, way prior, but it wasn't you know an ongoing thing. And right. um, one of the things that we noticed right away was that they more than covered their fees by bringing in money. And so um, just curious as to whether or not we should expect the same. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> That I is our goal. So too. Yes. So um, anyway, I just because because I don't know how much more difficult it is if it's you know from a state level to a federal level, um, if it's so much more competition that we really don't have a great chance, and that's why we've never done this before. I, this is new to me, so right. I'm just kind of asking for your yeah. guidance. No, absolutely. I absolutely understand that, and I'm a big steward of of local dollars. My family has a history in local government, so I absolutely understand why that's an important question. 
state governments, a lot of federal funding flows through the states. Mm -hmm. A lot of state money, of course, goes out as well through grants. And so at the federal level, you look, it's, it is very different in okay. the sense that uh, there are fewer. The dollars typically are more. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a $2 million state grant, it may be $20 million at the federal level. So the return on it is, much, is, is a little better that way, uh, even though it's fewer. Uh, there are opportunities. One of the things that we really focus on is we follow the money and we really help with, I don't want to say greasing the wheels because it has a bad connotation, but we work to make sure there's not hiccups in the system that are keeping you from getting dollars. And so right now with Congress allocating funding uh, directly to projects, that's something that's new and helpful that hasn't been around for about 10 years that we can help do as well. And because your member happens to be, uh, two of your, your, one of your House members and one of your Senate members happens to be on a, the Appropriations Committee, that's a little more helpful with us as we deal with federal agencies to guide uh, grants to local governments. Uh, there's definitely opportunity there. It exists. Of course, I can't make decisions for people, but we can make the best argument possible. And I will tell you, your staff, uh, just in the last several uh, weeks, have really provided enough data for us uh, that there's so much information that makes you more than, more than eligible for a grant. You have reasons why you should be in the top percentage getting funding for grants. Fantastic so. music to my ears. Now, I, I have to tell you, I was over at the, um, uh, uh, the, way, uh, the water treatment plant today with uh, Congresswoman Frankel, and, you know, I don't know if pictures would make a difference, but I'm telling you, the, the equipment that we are working with over there is yeah, probably era 1950s, 60s, has not been changed. So it's just, you know, just mind blowing to me that, you know, we are working with a, a, a plant providing the water for this entire city and other cities, right. um, you know, from a plant that basically is super antiquated. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility, I saw that on your list, um, of going for that when we're at that point where we're ready to groundbreak, because I know that we're we're looking at really kind of putting this on you know the fast track, get this thing right. done. So right. I know that this year would be early, but maybe next year is that possible? It is possible. There are definitely some funding opportunities that exist. Uh, there's some money, as the congresswoman mentioned this morning, available in the infrastructure bill uh, that will be flowing through the states. But there's also a portion of that funding that's been earmarked by Congress. So there's some money that can be used that way as well. And so. Definitely, that's an opportunity that exists. Yeah, it's a huge, very expensive project that we're going to be going down, so anything that we can get to help would be just wonderful. I, I do Vice have, Mayor? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Can you tell me the process? You are our lobbyist. You are not our grant writer. That's incumbent upon the city. So if we have no one who really knows how to fill these forms out properly, Mr. Moore, we don't have a designated grant writer. It appears that each department is responsible for whatever they might be doing. Perhaps this is something we need to discuss as to a dedicated person. The money flows, but if we don't do it correctly, it's going to, the application will arrive dead in the water because this is missing, that's missing. I know there's a specialty in this art of grant writing, so. We did have one when Joan was here. I don't know if um, we do now. As we, if I may, my objective assessment being on board a little over six months, we actually have a number of talented, capable staff people in multiple departments who is able to execute that function and we've had some fairly successful experiences to that effect. What we have not had is someone representing us federally to help us to identify and connect the dots with respect to the opportunities. One of the justifications for recommending the Color 9 group. However, as we continue to experience more opportunities to this effect via the anticipated good work of the Color 9 group, I will be offering recommendations in terms of internal resources that might become necessary so that we can be both successful and productive as possible. Thank you. Mr. Boyles, anything? Also. Okay, now that can, yep. Very good. 
Did you have anything you wanted to say? I was just going to add one more sure. thing to that. Our staff, just so that you all are aware, I'm a former, I, I worked appropriations. I wasn't on the appropriations committee, but I worked for a chairman of a committee and helped appropriate uh, funding for projects all through Florida when I was in Congress. And my staff, because we just have a really passion for we have a long, uh, a strong passion for local governments. We all have a bit of a history with that. Most of our staff come from a federal agency program that they were over and oversaw grant programs, created grant programs. So whenever the city is applying for a grant, one of the things that we always offer and always uh, suggest is that if we could take a look at the grant early before it's submitted so that we can walk through it, lessons learned that we have in 20 years of doing it, we can then make suggestions, go back to you guys, and help make sure we're on the right track. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Willis. If there's thank nothing so more, thank you so much, and thanks for Appreciate the update. And we can't thank wait you. to uh, see you again with a with a with another update, and hopefully it'll be positive. That's right. Thank, thank you. you so I mean, this is, but you know, <laughs> even more positive for the city. I hear you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Very good. We're moving on to the current construction projects, and that would be Missy Barletto. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. Um, starting off a little bit differently tonight, at our last meeting, we had a gentleman who asked about the traffic calming plan as a result of the Atlantic Crossings um, construction. And I said I would bring it back to you. Um, I would like to first of all say that this was proposed by Atlantic Crossings. Mm -hmm. The traffic calming plan that is here has had no engineering oversight or um, traffic modeling or anything. So we, this is what was part of the settlement agreement. Um, in the settlement agreement, there is a payment from the developer of Atlantic Crossings to the city of $125,000. That's a drop in the bucket of what this will cost. Um, it's due to the city 14 days after the earlier of two things, either that the project is vested with the city or that the city has um, issued a building permit for building two. So the project has been vested. It was vested in August. And we are working with Atlantic Crossings on getting these payments in-house. Um, the proposed improvements that were a part of that, that proposed traffic calming plan included on Southeast 1st Street. I and mean, these are, the pictures are very small, but the top picture is for Southeast 1st Street. Um, it shows increased median length. Um, there was a new stop sign at one of the intersections and it, ca it called for the installation of landscape nodes similar to how we have done in other neighborhoods. On um, Palm Square, the travel lanes have been narrowed. In some places, they're very wide on Palm Square, which allows pe people think they have, you know, it's a racetrack if it's wide enough space. So the travel lanes uh, appear to be narrowed, and there is an inclusion of a new median. And then on Southeast 7th Avenue, it called for um, a narrowed entranceway and travel lanes. Um, I had a really hard time seeing the um, attachment to the settlement agreement to see exactly what it was that they were calling for. And, um, but that's what it looks like. And then um, a raised paver crosswalk somewhere around the, the towards Southeast First Street. So that is what was included in the settlement agreement. If you have any questions about that. Could I ask you a question? Sure. You say that it's a $125,000 payment due the city, mm -hmm. 14 days after the earlier of, and then item number one is fully vested, and you say they are fully vested? Yeah, they were fully vested. Um, the Development Services Department sent the letter on August 27th. So we've been waiting, and we were due yes. money back. In, we are working with them on September. the on the settlement payments currently. Are we charging uh, any kind of interest, or are there any penalties? What? No. Note to her attorney: when we have those things happen, we need to probably put stuff like that in. It reminds me of the hole in the wall over at the um, you know the seawall that we put in over at uh, Veterans months. Park. Late. That was supposed to be, you know, filled by those that asked us to hold that 
hole in the wall and it never got done and it ended up being that it was a you know a city project or whatever do we don't we have no means of getting it essentially the only the only means we have is a motion to enforce a settlement agreement which would go to the court and the remedy is to comply with the settlement agreement I, i've been in contact with mr handler who's the attorney for atlantic crossing on a separate issue and i'll reach out to him tomorrow and, and confirm thanks he's going to make this payment thank you that's my only question all right uh, was there something else i heard a rumor that there is a desire to close southeast first street is that anywhere in the works to your knowledge so I will move on to the next portion of the presentation which is our regular discussion of um, of traffic inconveniences associated with these private development projects um, Atlantic Co crossings has a um, has requested a full road closure for sheep pile removal along Northeast first Street and that's expected to start at the near the end of the month. As you know, when they when they um, begin to build the underground garage, they put in in very big um, steel sheet piles, and at the end of the construction project, they remove those. Right, so that takes a very large crane, and they are they are pulling these big heavy. Um, pieces of steel up out of the ground and it's kind of dangling over the roadway it's not a good mix for cars pedestrians and that kind of construction activity so if if their proposal is that this will go longer than two weeks by ordinance we have to bring that back to Commission for approval and that's that's each instance of a road closure that's not an aggregate of road closures over the life of a project so for South, for Northeast First Street, we have this issue going on toward the end of the month. They say they'll be done in less than two weeks with that portion of it. Um, there will be uh, accommodations made for people who live toward the intracoastal on Northeast First Street to be able to access their homes through the Veterans Park, mm -hmm. Park parking lot, which also happened when the sheet piles went in to begin with. So it will be a repeat of that. Um, the sheep piles are not just on Northeast Fort First Street. They're also along Federal Highway. And, and similar to how they went in, there, was, there were, was a full lane Federal Highway closure. There would have to be that. Again, if they choose to remove those, we are in conversation with them about potentially leaving the sheet piles in place and not pulling them. They're, um, that's a, a business decision on their part, and, and we're talking with them about that potential. They say when they would right. be getting back to you? I'm sorry. No. I can't. It's open discussions. We're talking to them on a regular basis. Thank you. Can we withhold closing the road until we get the hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars? <laughs> okay. So this, I'm sorry. It's I know it's an, maybe an unreasonable question, but at a certain point, it's six months out, and their con their construction continues. Mm. Perhaps if we could slow them down a little, they might be more apt to pay us. They've been very good about speaking with us. I know Anthea and I have have had issues with them, so I think sometimes just you know. A group meeting can alleviate a lot of these concerns. Okay. So I'm happy to engage in that with them. I appreciate um, that. And have those right. conversations. It's Thank the you. same with our staff. They reach out to mm -hmm. us well in advance. As far as uh, the federal highway road closure, that is an FDOT permit. It is not a city permit. Mm -hmm. But FDOT will not give them the permit unless we agree. Mm -hmm. Right. And there you have it. Right. So that is that. Thank you. Any more questions about that? Okay, so the other um, big project that's ongoing is the Peachtree Hotel Group. Um, they're continuing to, to build their underground um, garage. The same sidewalk closures are in place. Nothing new is happening with that. However, I will say that they are planning another very large cement pour, which happens in the, in the night. They, the trucks will not be staging on site for this. They'll be staging off site and bring one truck in at a time. 
So Delray Park Plaza is the, the plaza that is just to the north of George Bush Boulevard on the east side of Federal Highway. And they have been working on um, installing their, their entranceway and things, and there are intermittent traffic, um, traffic interruptions as a result of that. And then the last slide for this is the, the commercial sites that we have actively under construction. Um, we changed the criteria by which we look at that. So instead of just looking at the very, very large ones, we're looking at all the commercial construction. So this went up 57 from the last presentation. And there are 90 commercial um, sites actively under construction in the city right now. There are 112 single-family homes. That's up three from our last presentation. And the number of active single-family permits, that means the permits that have been pulled, it doesn't necessarily mean that construction is ongoing, but that is down 22 to 744. And as I tell you every meeting, this is how we tell the public about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, question for... Uh, uh, counsel uh, legal In the first part of um, Missy's presentation she mentioned that uh, if somebody needed to close off a major road that they would have to only come to the Commission if it's two weeks longer than two weeks mm -hmm. um, however it is not a aggregate it is um, you know it's just it per occurrence what would now I'm not saying that this one's going to do it because they're saying they can get it done in two weeks so maybe they go a couple of days over but what would what would prevent a developer to who knows that it's going to take them four months to do something not to just close it down for a couple of days and then start it again and close it down for a couple of days and start it again until they get out to that point to avoid having to come before the commission who says no uh, nothing, but uh, that wasn't my understanding of the interpretation. Okay. I thought we went with the aggregate. So once they hit 14, you know, if it, if it starts lagging on, I do think it needs to come back to the commission. Okay. Um, the way that it's written now, it, it, it's not clear. Okay. So well, I think that that would be important to do because we have had road closures that have been mm -hmm. very extensive, and that was one of the reasons that we put that as a rule. So if there's a way to be able to clear that up so that there isn't a way to be able to play with that and make it a non-aggregate type situation. I think we can always look at the intent, and I think if staff were to see that somebody yeah. were coming back with one to two day requests, I think after a while we can make an interpretation and bring it back to you. But I do agree that if there is consensus for us to amend that portion of the code, I know Anthea and I went back and forth with it because it, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. And so if the intent is you know, anything more than 14 with the understanding that if the commission may see every time there's a closure after 14 days, whether it's one to two days or 30 days that it's gonna be coming before you, you know, that is something that um, you'll have to consider at that time because it does, it will create a, a backlog in the sense that they won't be able to move forward until they come to the commission Correct. that's on your agenda. So I think it's something that's worthy of a discussion, but I think at this point, um, I think we would just look at each one individually and determine if it is a legitimate, you know, short-term closure or if it's something that is trying to avoid the 14-day trigger. Very good. Thank you. All right. Anything else? That, yes. That was it? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to um, say something about what uh, Commissioner Casal said. It appears prior to our present city attorney that all the contracts, I shouldn't say all, I should never be that definite, it appears that there are sections of the contracts that the city has entered into that it says something but that's as far as it goes. There's nothing to enforce it. There's no teeth. There's no, give us $125,000 if this doesn't happen and, and when that happens. But, and if they don't, okay. So I, I think going forth, I know you will do your uttermost best to prevent that from happening in the future. Thank you. I don't think it's fair to say that there's no teeth. There's always teeth. We can always go back to court. Okay. You know, and, and there barring is court. Barring, co barring court. Barring court. It appears that everything has to happen with the court action. No. Well, no. That, that one's specific because it's a settlement agreement. So that one went to court, and everything that's in that contract was, um, was approved by the court. So when there's a violation, 
that has to go back to the court and, and there is process to it that we have to comply with. You know, I, I will say this, um, and this is no, um, no offense to staff, but that agreement has a lot of parts, a lot of moving parts to it. And I do think that the fact that we don't have automated computer systems mm -hmm. where public works knows what planning and zoning is doing, because we lack that, and I know we're doing something about it, without that, that infrastructure, it, it's almost impossible. Yeah. You know, I mean, somebody has to bring it to our attention, then we look at it, we rectify it, we will get that money, but it does create that delay because we're not having those communications and those conversations aren't having. So, you know, it is a function of our delayed technology, but I do think that moving forward that those, those things will be remedied to some extent. Thank you for the clarification. Just, just real quick on the coattails of that, if I, re, if I may, just remind this commission of um, the uh, demonstration by our planning director, Anthea, do you notice bringing the packet of that big, huge stack and showing us that this has to go to the planning department and then it goes over, it gets driven over, so it's like a day late to get to this department and then it that's how we're doing things. And to be able to know all the little fine details in there as well, it starts to get really kind of dicey. So that's what we're dealing with. And I understand it completely. Hopefully we'll get out of that. Uh, Commissioner Boylston. If, uh, if, if payment doesn't show up, let's say, in the next 30 days, you said what would be the step, next step? It's a motion to enforce the settlement agreement. And we'd essentially go back to the court, mm -hmm. file a motion. And Did we get a consensus to put that on our next uh, agenda? You're that'll not getting send a, That'll send a message. Oh, I, I, us, I'm not us. objecting to it, uh, of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. But, but I do yeah. think we need to make that initial communication oh, absolutely. You know, as a almost of like course. a notice of default. Yeah. Give them an opportunity to cure, and then if it doesn't, how about I'll say on a future on a future agenda? Just I think thirty days is appropriate. Time. Perfect. Thirty okay. days. But I would just suggest because Missy said that the city has to agree to the road closure. <laughs> I would just suggest that the city say, "No, we're not well, really no, into we that." Can't. We can't well, we can unreasonably, unreasonably withhold consent I, or permission for six things. months. It's not unreasonable. I don't know what the communications were, and I do feel that we have a responsibility to let someone know, hey. You guys owe us this money. If they willfully refuse, then by all means, mm -hmm. we can take whatever appropriate okay. action is reasonable under the circumstances. But without knowing what communications were had and knowing what that settlement agreement looks like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's the appropriate next This sends a, a message Fine. in regards to... Yeah. Commissioner Casale, they may not know it either. We just <laughs> right. might have come to it before they did. That's all. Okay, great. So now we're going to move on to, are you finished? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm done. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> the uh, updates. All right, so moving on to um, uh, comments from the public. Anybody would like to speak, please step up to the microphone, state your name and address, and you will have three minutes. Good evening, Patrice Schroeder. I'm at 1701 North Flagler Drive, West Palm Beach, Florida. And I'm here on behalf of uh, 211 Awareness Week and Month. And I want to thank uh, Mayor and the Commissioners for supporting our proclamation. Um, 211 is in its, te uh, I should say, sixth decade of service. We've answered over 3 million calls. Last year it was over 100 million call 100, excuse me, thousand calls. And um, of that, we had about 139,000 needs expressed. We had 46,000 individuals who reached out to us with mental health concerns and substance use disorder concerns. And of that, we had 3,800 that were of suicidal concerns. Um, in light of the tragedies that we've seen, the, the high profile suicides, and I just learned from a young student I happened to talk to on Saturday, one of the local high schools had just experienced five kids within the school year. Um, so this is something we need to look out for our fellow, you know, whether it's a student, coworker, family member, loved one. If you see something that you trust your gun instinct, reach out and get help for them because sometimes people in a, uh, extreme depression and overwhelm just can't make their way. So we need to be diligent. And this is a beautiful community. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, we had 26,000 individuals reach out to us with housing concerns. Mm -hmm. And I know that's been a, a thing that we've been hearing and seeing more prevalently now in the media. Uh, we've had a young lady called us. She's a single mom. Her rent was increased $800. She goes, what am I going to do? 
And unfortunately, what can we tell them to do? We had a family call us. They're now living in their car. Um, basically, where can we take our kids to go to the bathroom and where can we get showered? Because now they're living in their car and they're continuing to d do their job, go to work, and get their kids to school. Um, so I think this is something that we really, I know it's a, it's a national you know, problem as well, not just a local concern. But at any rate, um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, 211 is your local community helpline and crisis hotline, and we're here 24 7. So we're helping people engage with the meal sites, the free food, the free clinics, and all these types of wonderful resources. So if you know of somebody that is in need of assistance, just share the word that 211 is out there. They can simply dial 211, um, and we're there 24 7. They can go to 211palmbeach.org and do self search for resources or get additional information on our programming. But I want to thank you very much, and uh, I didn't want to be too heavy, but you know we do have to take some of these topics seriously, especially getting, you know, breaking down barriers to people, helping them to get mental health that they need, uh, that care. Thank you so much, and appreciate it as always. Lovely. Thank you, Patrice, and thank you for what you're doing for the thank community. You. We so appreciate it. It's needed. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Michael Muha. I reside at 622 Southeast 4th Avenue. Uh, this is regarding code enforcement and the tough job they have. I'd like to read an email I just wrote, you know, before I came here because everything happened so quickly. Uh, I'm writing to inform you that I plan to address the City Council today regarding the incident I witnessed and heard on a code enforce enforcement site, uh, site visit Friday, February 4th, 2022 at 626 Southeast 4th Avenue, Delray Beach. After receiving a call today, I feel I have to address what occurred and the effects it seems to have had on the non-compliance determination and the resulting fine by the code board. We feel that we are being asked to compromise and renegotiate an existing city of Delray code. Management needs to support their employees in pursuing the process. Uh, I haven't had much time to do this, but I thought it was important that I come and say something. On this date, you had three uh, code enforcement employees come to explain again to the, uh, the landlord of this property the issue. And I was in the front of my yard, and when they got to the front, I heard them talking, and they didn't seem, the homeowner didn't seem to like what they were saying, and at which time, he said, look over here, went to my wall, grabbed my planner, ripped it off the wall, and threw it down on the ground. And at which time the employees all were shocked and walked away and got onto the city property. Uh, I saw it, and so my wife saw it when it was inside, and we went around and addressed the person, you know, because this has been going on for three years, we got to code, and I, when I got this call <laughs> I got uh, I don't know what to say it felt like the city had just reversed its decision I've got to make the decision now the court board ruled 5-0 that the man was in non-compliance put heavy fines on him it's been going on for three years and you know these code enforcement people do a hard job they're not supported it doesn't seem like to all of a sudden change their tone because uh, they didn't have that before and this all of a sudden, you know, I've worked with these people for three years on this issue, and <laughs> this was a big turnaround to say, come and renegotiate. You know, what am I to renegotiate one of your contra, your, your the code board's decisions? I just feel very let down. Um, you have some good employees. If you like to keep them, you should support them. And I've talked to Mr. Moore, and I didn't have a chance to tell you about this because it happened so soon I wouldn't you know that's why I wrote it I didn't want to but I knew the meeting was today I was going to come talk on a different issue maybe but thank you for your time thank you. I mean I, I hope that you'll fall I don't know anything about this and I don't know what we're not supporting but um, I think we have Matt as well and Hannah did have an opportunity to visit with the leadership of the Department of Neighborhood and Community Services as Mr. Muha stated, I've had an opportunity to meet with him and his wife even at the office of the city manager level. And this is a continuous history issue, but matter is well in hand. It is a matter of the ACE process. 
if you all are interested, I can have Mr. Sammy Walter offer a brief word or two. I, I think it's, it doesn't need to be stated here necessarily, but I just want to make sure that something's followed up because obviously there's something going on here that we're not aware of and not that we're involved in this. But and, and you are not, right. no. And on that note, for the record, a follow-up communication was offered to Mr. Muha in terms of where we are and what's moving forward. So I think I should give that an opportunity to be productive and it is consistent with the process necessary to execute. Very good, thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh. Hi, sir. Hi. Good after, or good after, afternoon. I used to say evening, but you guys do afternoons. Um, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, thank you again. I'm back again. I'm Mitch Katz, 1618 West Classical Boulevard. I have two items. The first thing is as, as I'm speaking as chair of the Education Board. Um, last month, last week, <laughs> my, things are going quick. You passed a resolution. Since then, we did receive plans. We spent most of our meeting last night. Actually, I had to extend our meeting um, because we wanted to actually vote on something uh, to recommend. So the plans and the talk, and, and one of the commissioners mentioned that all these meetings said they want a vocational technical school. When you look at the plans, the ag and I, what I gave you was the latest draft that was done in January from, that's the second page, from an architect showing really just classroom space not really set up for this for a true technical college it's more like a ged testing center mm -hmm. when we have an empty college, high school right next door that could be used for those purposes and we could truly get this again those plans were designed before 2020 mm -hmm. um, so what i gave you this is actually a february 2022 document that gives you an idea so you're the ones that are going to be speaking to the school board about what you want so you know what the definition of a career and technical education is so that's that first sheet so you have that uh, the board was voted unanimously for come ask that you take a look at the plans and really and there's plans too it's it's plans we want to see you look at that's as a campus mm -hmm. that's what the community wanted we're seeing a lot of fences and separation where it should be one big campus um, where a lot can be done all right take that hat off second half I'm speaking to you as a member of the board of directors of Temple Sinai of Palm Beach County here in Delray Beach uh, I want to thank you for, I know that uh, one of the commissioners brought up a consensus item that my understanding will be on the March 1st uh, consent agenda to make the working definition of um, anti-Semitism from the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance official um, in the city. So it is on the agenda or it's not? It is. Oh, it is on tonight. Okay. Uh, it was on, not on the, it must have got on there really late. Um, but anyway, so it's on the agenda. We want to thank you for that. We were hoping that we'd actually, um, if it was going to be the next agenda, the rabbi could come and do a presentation on the rise in, in anti-Semitism, and we, she still could do that. And she'd love, so if you'd like to have uh, Rabbi Viva Bass come and do a little presentation, as you know, in some cities, especially in Fort Lauderdale and Miami, um, you're seeing a lot of flyers being distributed, uh, hate crime, especially um, in, in the, um, against Judaism and anti-Semitism in general has been on the rise recently, including some of the things our synagogue has had to do, investing in police um, presence, training, uh, cameras, light, you know, all these different things because of what happened um, in Texas just a few weeks ago, and then what happened in Pittsburgh two years ago. Um, the rise is, is tremendous. So I, I just want to thank you all for making a priority in one week, getting on the agenda past tonight. I mean, that's just really great. So again, thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for being conscious of what's going on in our community. And anything you can do to help with the temple, because we are spending a lot of money uh, that we don't have in protection, um, police support, that type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening to all of you wonderful people. And thank you for all of you that you do. Um, I'm on a, a, the board and the committee in my building, and I can't tell you what I'm going through just for managing that. <laughs> so it gives me a renewed respect for everything that you do for all of us every day. Um, my name is Rita Brana, and I'm at 50 East Road in the lovely Delray Beach, Florida. Um, everyone loves the property and buildings at Old School Square. Everyone. Everyone appreciates consciously or subconsciously the pockets of peace that it provides as you walk by. So when I saw plastered on social media, save old school square, I was uber concerned as everyone. However, when I read comments that some members of the board that manage old school square and their spokespeople were stating that their audits were years late because their accountants had issues due to COVID, I questioned the validity of that statement and everything else they were saying since as I speak to over 200 accountants a year, 
Not once had any of them stated that they could not complete a responsibility due to COVID. We have since watched meetings and read reports of a litany of issues with that management company. So quite frankly, the city is not divorcing the artists or the talented program specialists. I'm sure they can be considered at the new management company. Our responsive commission simply is divorcing an entity fraught with negative business practices. And so it's time to move past the conversations and recriminations. It's time for change. As a Delray Beach resident and taxpayer, I am absolutely support the vote of these responsible commissioners. And I look forward to the recommendations from our wonderful new city manager for a new management company to take care of our much loved old school square. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Gail Clark, 124 Northeast 7th Avenue, Delray Beach. Uh, I won't be nearly as eloquent as Rita, but I want to echo everything she said. No prepared notes. It's just I missed the meeting last week, and uh, but I watched it, and I was so dismayed to see how many citizens, non-citizens, uh, or should I say non-residents, neighbors, friends, former friends, relatives showed up to really denigrate all of you and what you're trying to do. I know this has been a trying uh, six months. Uh, perhaps the outcome is not what any, you know, everybody would have hoped for, but I want to thank you so much for standing up for not just me, a taxpayer, and the taxpayers who really appreciate what you've done, but also taxpayers who have reviled you, said, hurled insults at you, sued you, treated you terribly. I know you're standing up and doing the right thing for them, too, and it's difficult. Uh, there's not enough money in Florida for me to do what you do. I mean, you're all better men than I am. So anyway, um, thank you for what you do. I really appreciate it, and I do speak for a lot of people who, who also feel the same about you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any more comments? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Moving on to the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. All right. We're going to start with 7AA, which was originally 6I3, approval of resolution number 27-22. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I, in my discussion of the um, agenda items with uh, Mr. Moore, I just wanted to really maybe just discuss the fact that we constantly are buying equipment, but we don't say what we're going to do with it, what our, what our plans are, uh, maybe even where it's going, although I think this one is with Public Works. So a lot of money is spent repeatedly, and I just thought that maybe we should I don't know, quarterly say what's going on. Mr. Moore said that we've never even had an auction of our equipment, so oh, wow. maybe that's, you didn't say that? Did I? I'll be Mr. prepared Moore. to respond in a second after you continue. I'm, I'm about finished. I just think we should hone in on this item because it's a large expenditure, a large part, uh, equipment, cars, fire engines, et cetera, when we really, I don't think, have had a good handle on it. Thank you. So if I may, Madam Mayor and Vice Mayor, thank you very much. So to echo and essentially support the observations being offered by Vice Mayor Shirley Johnson, direction is being initiated literally in the coming weeks relative to fleet inventory so as to provide a picture for the City Commission as part of the annual proposed budget process in terms of where we are to also take under consideration, and again, this is me speaking objectively, taking under consideration any excess fleet that may remain. So, for example, you've recently authorized a huge fleet of police vehicles. What happens to the vehicles that those new vehicles are replacing? There's not been a lot of commentary or information provided to the City Commission to give you a sense as to how that all works and what actually happens in that regard. That was the basis for a program public auction, for example, because the longer new vehicles, new equipment, 
inter if I interacts with old vehicles, old equipment, the more expensive operations becomes. So in terms of fiscal responsibility, we need to work collaboratively with all departments in that regard. So via the March 4th City Commission information letter, March 4th, 2022, I will have an initial summary in terms of our efforts to move in that direction so that we can create an environment to get to that place. Likewise, the Office of the City Manager will work collaboratively with all vehicle heavy, equipment heavy operated departments so that we can get our arms around that to the extent that we can. There's a lot of good work that's being done internally to that effect, but in terms of connecting the dots with city commission policy and understanding in that regard, that's what's missing. So I'm looking forward to creating an environment such that everybody can be more knowledgeable in that regard, as well as to update some, some in administrative direction with respect to how we keep operations efficient. You basically hear that it's necessary to replace a piece of equipment or vehicles. Well, what happens to the older vehicles, the older pieces of equipment? What happens to that? Because again, the longer it remains here as part of operations, it simply elevates costs. And that's something we should not allow to continue to happen. So we need to do as much as we possibly can to identify efficiencies in operations as a result. So again, beginning with the March 4th information letter report, a brief summary outlining where we will go in this regard, and we'll make it a more integral part of the upcoming proposed budget process and other considerations. Mr. Moore, may I ask, we've been converting our fleet from, I believe, gasoline to um, electric powers. I think we've seen some newer vehicles on our streets. There's been and, some activity to that effect, yes. Right, and there's a shortage of um, vehicles in the general um, community population, the city. Uh, it's getting more and more expensive, so perhaps if this is something we can do, we can offload some of those vehicles, if possible, and maybe make a little profit. Can I, just, just piggybacking on this, I, I'm not fully apprised of what uh, Commissioner, I'm sorry, the Vice Mayor is, is speaking about. So are you saying that we buy equipment but we don't dispose of the old equipment so then we have the old equipment still there and it's an expense? Or I, I'm just trying to make an understand, I need to understand what you're trying to say because I don't understand. We will outline <clears throat> exactly what happens. Okay. So if there's a large piece of equipment, a vehicle, whatever the case may be, being presented for review and consideration. We need to provide a sense as to what does happen. You have not been provided that information, and Vice Mayor is shaking her head no because what I'm saying is correct. I'm simply suggesting that we need to do the absolute best job we can to advise the City Commission what happens with replacement vehicles or once a new piece of equipment is authorized for purchase what then happens in terms of the piece of equipment that's being replaced. Right. Based on previous experiences relative to public auctions, other activities, et cetera, my job is to get a handle in terms of where we are. Okay, so you're not even aware of where we are. You're gonna give us the information once you find out where we are on all those pieces of equipment and what we've done in the past is what you're trying to say. You're gonna- Yes, ma'am, so that, that is clear, but not only that, it will become an integral part of sure. every fiscal year proposed budget process. The capital improvement program schedule, we're simply working to develop a more transparent process so that you are aware, such that these questions and concerns will not be again experienced. And, and you know, interestingly enough, you bring that up because it was a question that I have, we're doing a whole new fleet of those- uh, Police uh, vehicles. Golf, no, the golf carts. And that what too. was the first thing I asked was, where do the old ones go? Because, you know, That's I related. see a lot of them riding around in my neighborhood, and so I was just curious <laughs> as to what <laughs> happens with those one. golf carts. And anyway. you know, Madam Mayor, that's exactly related to it. That would be part of this process. Exactly, I just so. was wondering if there's like a, a depository that we just kind of go down and grab one, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, do. thank you for that. We, uh, did, did you answer the question? Did it that answer that answers my question. I'm, I'm in for buying one if I could. Okay. Oh, <laughs> So I'll do a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All right, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. And I am not saying that there is anything inappropriate about anybody riding a golf cart. They probably have them. I just was curious because it just seemed odd to me. I, and I didn't know what happened to them afterwards. And that was in, in, to your point. We don't know what happens to the equipment afterwards. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we're moving on to 7A, which is resolution number... 03-22, and this is a quasi-judicial um, 
item, and we also have um, resolu following resolution 04-22 uh, is also quasi-judicial. So what I'm going to do is read the quasi-judicial rules into record, and then we'll proceed. Um, this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be allowed 20 minutes each to represent their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person representing an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city, commission, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal te testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made based on sorry, made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the required requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. So at this point in time, if there's anybody that's going to be speaking to resolution 03-22 or 04-22, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. Okay, so the first um, uh, resolution that we're going to be speaking, I think it's both together, right? We can do them joint. Okay, great. So if there is any um, um, ex parte communication, I'm going to go um, by commission. Um, Commissioner? I've Wilson. spoken with the applicant and his representatives. Okay. Vice Mayor? Yes. Sorry. I've spoken with the representatives and the, and the applicant. Okay, very good. I spoke with Ms. Miskell. Okay, and Commissioner Cassell? I spoke with the applicants a long time ago, but not relating to this topic. Okay. Um, it may be on the server. I don't think I have any communications, uh, with the exception of I did watch uh, the PNZ meeting, so I'm going to disclose that. I've obviously drive by the site um, continuously. <laughs> so there you go. Um, at this point in time, we'll have the city staff enter the project, uh, the file into the pro into the record. Good evening, Anthea Genotis, De Director of De Development Services. Blah, sorry. Um, okay, so you have two resolutions before you. Um, they have two distinct sets of findings. So I'm going to enter two um, files into the record, even though they'll have separate action. Um, the first um, agenda item is uh, for the conditional use, and I'd like to enter file 2021-184 into the record. And then resolution 0422, is a waiver request and I would like to enter file 2020-080 into the record and the applicant is here to provide an overview. Thanks. Very good. Good evening. My name is Todd Benson. I'm with Peb Capital on behalf of Sunday Village, formerly known as Midtown Delray. It's a pleasure to be here in front of this board for the first time as the new owner since the prior approval in 2017. We're looking forward to discussing this important historical project, which we are extremely excited to start. We acquired the site with a certified site plan from the prior developer, Hudson Holdings, approximately two years ago, thinking that we took over a shovel-ready project, but we ultimately found that this was not the case, and we've been working with staff to improve the overall constructability of the project as there were technical construction-related issues that needed to be resolved. We've also made improvements to embrace the historical nature of this development through our design in addition to the careful and thoughtful treatment of the historic homes. We view the history of this location and its historical buildings as one of the key factors that will ultimately differentiate our development from other projects and truly make it memorable. Mike Cavelli will be presenting an overview tonight of Sunday Village and will specifically address the agenda items. We look forward to sharing all the progress that's been made alongside staff and the community since taking over the project. I also want to highlight that PEB is a multi-generational and local company that has roots in Delray. We are owners, operators, managers, and our ownership structure is set up for the long term. We have a vested interest in working together with the community to build a special project that will stand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Valley. Good evening, Mike Cavelli, 1209 South Swinton. Let me get to where we need to be here. Um, since it's been 
a number of years since you've seen this. We thought we would very quickly go through and just show you some of the changes that we've made. Um, and I think you'll be pleased with some of the things we did. Um, and, and I think that will also help to give some context to these two items. So um, very quickly, um, this is the location of the project, primarily bisected north and south by Swinton Avenue and east and west by First Street, and it has frontage on Atlantic. Um, there is a certified plan. This is the plan. Um, tonight we're going to mainly be talking about the area on Block 61. Um, this is the certified plan, and as, as Mr. Benson said, there were construction issues with this, and so we had to do some changes. Um, we've tried to, this is the, the proposed plan that's being processed right now, and side by side, as you can see, it's very similar. But um, there's a lot of significant little changes that, that have been made to this plan. Um, the um, uses change somewhat. Um, the, the red on the left is um, there's two restaurants, which we'll talk about those later tonight. And uh, retail on the first floor and the second and third floor are offices. And they, those areas also contain lockers and, and showers for people that bike to work with, with uh, bike lockers and things like that. The purple color down at the bottom of the page, those are all office space now. Um, so we have some really high class office space that, that we, we can bring into the block. The um, yellow uh, three buildings on the north are the historical homes that will be restaurants, and the blue will be retail. Mm -hmm. um, there was an abandonment of the alleyway. Um, we decided that it really needed to be a, some kind of a service drive, so we've actually brought a service drive in. We're going to use um, retractable ballers to control it. It'll be one way. Since PEB will manage and operate the project, they can control when deliveries happen. So um, that will be a good thing. Um, but this is large enough to handle the big Cheney Brother trucks so that we don't have trucks sitting in the middle of the street loading and unloading. Um, also, we moved all of the dumpsters inside buildings. Um, and, and in this particular case, there, this, this dumpster you see in the, in the yellow square is for the two restaurants primarily and, and the office building. But it is internal, it's air conditioned, and uh, it has the ability to be serviced from the same service drive. Also, the back of house are internal for can wash and mat wash, so you don't have that smell, greasy oil in the alley like you do all over town. So we've taken a lot of time to try and make this functional in terms of, of, of this thing being built. Um, as far as the historical, excuse me, historical village, there, there are, have been revisions to that. Um, this is the approved site plan showing the underground um, construction and as you can see the the blue squares are the locations of the ultimate location of the historical homes which all ended up either on the parking garage on a drainage structure or partially on both or or, or somewhat on ground so so you have issues of uh, unstable foundations that are kind of a nightmare construction wise in addition because of them being on that all of these homes are going to have to be put up on girders and stacked al along um, Swinton Avenue during the construction of the underground park garage and vault. We redesigned the parking garage so that none of the, these units will, will be on a structure when, when this is finished. Um, and, and here you can see side by side the difference in, in what we've done. So what, what this allows us to do is it lets us move these buildings directly to a permanent foundation right up front so that restoration can start on them. The two buildings in yellow, which is Cathcart in the middle, and the other one is the, I think it's a peach color house on the corner, do not move at all. So we're only moving four houses in, in this particular case, and none of them are on a structure. Um, and these are preliminary sketches, but we just wanted to show you some of the things in terms of what our, we're envisioning the streetscape looking like. Um, along Swinton Avenue with these homes. Um, we will be rebuilding the wall for Cathcart, so that'll be preserved. Um, 
And then we're going to one by one look at these, each one of these, these, these buildings. Um, and here's an example of how we're looking at them. This is the rectory building. Um, the, the drawing on the left is what was approved and the one on the right is what the house looked like. We're proposing to bring it back to its original look with the same shake shingles, even moving the chimney to where it's supposed to be and taking the shutters off. And you, know, you can see side by side what it looks like. Um, additionally, there's a non-historic structure on the rear, which would be this little porch area to the left of the, the building on the right. We're going to duplicate the front porch onto the back and um, that will help to energize the back of it on the Paseo, which is internal to the project. And you can see the brown roof on the left side of the Paseo and, and see how that interacts with the pedestrian mm -hmm. pathway. That pathway also has a breezeway that goes all the way through the building out to the civic site on Atlantic and Swinton. This is what the excuse me, what the Paseo would look like. Um, that would be Sunday House to the south. The windmill is uh, indicative of what used to be at Sunday House. Um, so we're gonna bring a windmill back into this um, to, to kind of embrace some of the historic elements of the project. Notice the blue tile on the right planner, just for orientation, because I'm gonna spin you around to look north. And again, you see the blue tile on the left. The little building on the right is a stairwell and an elevator that comes up from the parking garage, which the previous plan did not have. Um, office buildings to the left. As we continue north, that's Cathcart to the right. Um, office buildings to the left, another stairwell and elevator that, that was not on the previous plan. And you can see the little, the little brown roof. That would be the roof of the rectory, and you can see how it, how it interacts with the Paseo. And Aaron, then up to the Mr. roundabout. Kefali, I'm sorry, can I just have a minute? Yes. So I'm giving Mr. Cavalli a little bit of license because I know he wants to show the whole project to you, but I just want you to be mindful that what you're, what you're approving right. today is not a site plan. Understand. So the, the beautiful pictures, you know, I, I would ask you to um, make sure that you realize that they're not relevant to mm -hmm. today's consideration. Today is outdoor dining and the porch front that, that's all, along Atlantic Avenue. So I, well, understood. Thank you. Okay. Um, tonight we're, we're going to look at porches. These are the locations of the porches, and you'll see more of that. Uh, we're taking cues from the, the Cathcart house, and we'll change those elevations uh, to, to reflect those porches. Um, this is kind of what the buildings will look like with when the porches are added. Um, and again, up on Swinton, sim similar addition of porches. And again, on the other side of the, the courtyard also. Um, the buildings for building nine, um, we've, we've had to move the buildings, do some internal tweaks to them, um, do some changes to the elevations, and then create a much better streetscape um, for, for, for those buildings with parallel parking. Um, the maintenance building was a enclosure that everyone looked down into. So we've changed that to a, an enclosed building, which also includes all of the transformers within buildings. So there are no transformers on the streetscape. The trellised area is a chiller so that there are no uh, air conditioning condensers all over the site. Um, and then the final building is building eight. And again, we created parallel parking, um, changed some elevations and created a much nicer streetscape. So um, the first item on the agenda right now is um, the conditional use. And I'm sorry, these are out of order, but here is the conditional use. So the project, this is in block 61, the project is zoned OSHAD and with a CBD overlay. The, where the, the squares are is where the, 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 port, the uh, outdoor dining will occur. Um, the orange are all of the restaurant locations, and the only other restaurant proposed right now is, is the existing restaurant in Sunday House. Um, we have a total of 21,375 square feet of restaurant, of which 2,000 square feet, or 9%, is outdoor dining, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. This is the location of, of the outdoor dining. Um, you can see the yellow is, is under the porches, which is the next item on the agenda, and the, the, the red are, are areas outside. 
um, each of those areas are about 500 square feet each. And as you can see, the, on the corner is the civic site. Um, at the PNZ meeting, there was a lot of conversation about noise and, and safety. Um, so I, I brought, I, I added this slide, and what it, what it basically shows is there are a lot of oak trees. There's a fountain with um, a, a knee wall around it. And along Atlantic Avenue, we're actually building a small retaining wall at the west, at the south end of the planter. So you have the curb, the planter, and then a wall, and then the sidewalk. So you have plenty of protection uh, in this area in terms of cars. The, o the other comment was about noise. And um, there's a lot of trees here that will help break that noise up. And, and remember, there's two restaurants very close to each other. One restaurant isn't going to be blasting music and, 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 and bothering the other. So these are, these are kind of uh, a higher end restaurants that are not going to have live entertainment or amplified music. Um, this gives you an idea of landscape removed. So you can see where the outdoor dining is with the indoor dining on the porches. Um, and this is kind of a zoom in of the one side. So you'll see that, that, um, the, the dining where the umbrellas are, they open to the sky. You can see under the porches, the other dining, and then the doorways go into the interior part of, of the restaurant. Notice the sidewalk to the right. There are no tables. There is no sidewalk cafe. The sidewalks are clear. The tables are back behind the building and are protected. Um, this is a composite of both sides that you can see, again, landscaping removed so you can get a better idea. You can see the transition from the outdoor dining to the covered dining to the indoor dining. And this is indicative of what the landscape plan that's on file right now uh, is, is showing. Um, so this is, this is what the, the landscape plan will demonstrate. So for the conditional use findings, um, per section 3.1.1, you have to look at findings related to land use map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with LDRs. I'm not gonna go through all those. Page four through six has a very detailed um, evaluation of all of these items and shows that positive findings can be made for all of those items. And then under section 2.4.5 E, 5A, and B, these are the two main things that, that you as a board would use as criteria. And it's basically saying that approving of this conditional use will not have a significantly detrimental effect upon the stability of the neighborhood in which it will be located. Certainly, the outdoor dining uh, has been positioned to where it's, it's on a very busy intersection. And it's, it's been done to be away from any single family housing. It um, is, has landscaping around it. There's, there's a lot of positives to it. It also um, creates that, that activity center and a connection that starts to move traffic or, and people uh, to the west. And so I would say that you could make a positive finding for this item. And then the other item is that it will not hinder development or redevelopment in nearby properties. We know the property across the street is, is going to be redeveloped and, and therefore, you know, there, there really should not affect uh, the redevelopment of other properties. So that's the conditional use item. So um, either we can take this up or we can do the other part at the same time. Shall we go to the? Yeah, do it together. Okay. I got to go up now. Let me see if I get up there. I finally learned how to use this thing. Uh, okay. The next item is uh, the request to, to use a porch as a frontage use. Um, in, in the code, uh, in, in the CBD, um, if you are along a street that is required retail frontage street, which Atlantic Avenue is, then the only two frontages you can have are storefronts or arcades. And um, this is, this is the, the location of where those porches would go. Um, and you've seen some images already of it. But um, we felt like um, we wanted to, to try to bring some historical elements into uh, the frontage on Atlantic um, the certified plan has a, a whole lot of different 
uh, building elevations. If the porches were to be approved, we meet all of the LDR standards in terms of the, the setbacks and the dimensional requirements in the, in the LDRs. Um, this gives you a, a, a plan view of where those porches are proposed to be located. Um, and in section view, going from, from Swinton Avenue to First Avenue, um, the, or the, the mustard yellowish line represents the outside edge of the porch, and the red lines represent the required pedestrian clear zone. So you can see the addition of porches do not encroach in the sidewalk in any way, but they also um, provide some areas where it's much larger. Um, this is the certified uh, elevations and what the proposed is with the porches. Um, again, in plan view and in elevation with the porch areas highlighted so you can see where those will occur. We took cues off of Cathcart in terms of the railing design, the square columns, and the brackets at the top. Um, so we, we're going to mimic that that design for the railings and bring some of those historical elements up to Atlantic Avenue. Um, since, since the Planning and Zoning Board meeting, we're reevaluating the width of these columns and, and we're working to make those a little narrower at their suggestion. And this would be uh, how the effect that the porches have on the facade. You see the, the windows in the back, those meet the storefront standards. So if the porches were not there, that would be what the frontage of the, of the, the building would look like. Um, again, we're, we're you know, trying to bring that railing detail. Uh, this is not a part of this topic, but just as you see, we'll try to bring that detail into some of the balconies. Um, and then at the other end, uh, I just showed you a, a, a rendering from the far right side. Now this is up near the civic site. Landscaping removed so you can see how the sidewalk gets wider and narrower as it goes, but it maintains the minimum uh, requirement and no sidewalk cafes. And this would be what it would be with the landscaping that is on the, the current landscape plans. And you can kind of see how you have that buffer between Atlantic and the, and the pedestrian area. On, the, on Swinton, again, using the, the cues from Cathcart, the wraparound porch, the square columns, the brackets at the top, um, same kind of a same kind of character with, with that we think really carries that 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 style on up up and again here it is with landscaping. So in terms of a waiver, you have um, some required findings, section 2.4.7 B5, um, that the waiver will not adversely affect the neighboring area. We feel that it will actually help the neighboring area. The waiver will not dim diminish public facilities. We don't think adding porches will affect public facilities, will not create an unsafe situation. We feel that it does create a safer situation because you have more eyes on the street with the porches. And it does not result in a special privilege. Um, anybody could apply for this as a, as a front of juice. Also, um, since it's in the CBD, 4.4135B2 has other, other items that the waiver will not result in inferior pedestrian experience on a primary street exposing parking garages and blank walls. The porches actually help to mask the black wall, blank walls and, and, and add some interest and in, in, in movement in, in, those, in those facades. The waiver will not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities of nearby buildings or land uses. We're trying to bring some of the elements into it rather than, than, than not. Um, the waiver will not erode connectivity of the street and sidewalk network or negatively impact the bicycle pedestrian master plan. We think that, that by, by doing this the way we're doing it, we're actually improving it because the porches actually give someone in inclement weather a place to, 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 to shelter. Um, and it, it does give different widths of sidewalk as you walk, so it, it creates interest, so it, we think it enhances it. And the waiver shall not reduce the quality of civic open spaces provided under this code. This actually enhances the civic open space because it, it, it is the, the framing items of two sides of that civic open space uh, that actually gives you more eyes from the offices that have exclusive use of those balconies on the upper floors and the restaurant on the lower floors. So we feel like for, per section 247B5 and 4.4135B2 that positive findings can be made. 
and you can find it in your hearts to approve this. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Cavelli. Your staff. Okay. So. Okay, so um, again, resolution 0322 is the conditional use to allow outdoor dining at night, and resolution 0422 is the waiver related to the porch frontage type. So um, pretty quickly, you've gotten a good overview of where the project is. This is a project that spans four different blocks. It's um, got um, a prominent location on the intersection of two main streets, um, West Atlantic Avenue and South Swinton. Um, and um, so let's go over the first one. So why do we need a conditional use to eat outside in the central business district? Well, this is actually in OSHAD. It has CBD overlay zoning, which picks up those uses in certain development standards. Um, however, um, OSHAD has a provision in the conditional use section that uh, limits outdoor dining in evening hours because it's a historic district that is populated by a lot of residential and things like that as well. Um, so it's important to look at, at the location of this um, particular request, um, which is, um, it's important to note that within the project, this is as geographically located as far away from residential uses on neighboring blocks as possible. It, it, it really is just, it couldn't be further away within their project. Um, so again, the outdoor dining is proposed within the um, civic open space um, that is designed at the intersection of West Atlantic and Swinton. Um, and so again, uh, the outdoor dining at night would be um, the outdoor dining at night is what you're weighing. Keep in mind, they can have it during the day. <laughs> so um, it is um, in conjunction with um, the adjoining restaurants. Um, it comprises about 2,000 square feet, um, and it would have the same operating hours as a restaurant. And so that's important to note. Um, there, nobody is actually um, requesting any extended hours beyond midnight, um, but the outdoor use is proposed to be open the same time as the indoor use. Um, restaurant uses have um, a, a pretty significant parking <laughs> requirement, um, and these spaces are parked within the project. They have been accounted for. Um, it's also important to note that um, the, the dining is being proposed um, within the boundaries of the private property, and um, the CBD allows this, but the exchange is that you can't come and ask for a sidewalk cafe as well. You get one or the other. So it's important to note that by locating the dining within the civic open space and on the porches, it's not going to be interfering with pedestrian movement um, at the intersection of a pretty busy um, you know, spot in our city. Um, the, the dining is also, based on the diagram, um, you know, this is where traffic is moving. There is not um, on-street parking, um, but there are uh, trees and curbs and then additional trees that line the space um, that provide um, some level of protection. And as well, the entire streetscape is, is between this area and um, moving traffic. Um, so again, just I actually thought I'd hidden the slide, so this is a surprise, sorry. <laughs> I, I had this in case you wanted to look at the location of um, adjoining um, uh, uses. Um, so again, this is uh, the idea of the location. Um, and you've seen these images before, but the dining would be both within the civic open space and within the porches if the companion request is also approved. Um, so again, uh, the staff report provides a full analysis of the required findings and ultimately the, the decision is whether approving the outdoor dining at night would have a significant detrimental effect on neighborhood stability or negatively impact um, the development of nearby properties. Um, this project was presented holistically on October 11th, 2021 at the DDA. They recommended approval. Um, I think Laura's concerned that it wasn't a full review of the entire project, so I'm looking to Michelle for that too. So um, I'm not sure if they have any additional comments to add. Um, the Historic Preservation Board reviewed this on January 5th 
um, this, the code requires that they make a recommendation to Planning and Zoning Board for conditional uses within historic districts, and we received a unanimous recommendation of approval from HPB. On January 24th, the Planning and Zoning Board um, reviewed the request, and they recommended approval with some conditions, and it was a four to two vote, four to one, excuse me, vote. Um, and there's concern, uh, which we're paying a lot of attention to downtown, related to noise, that somehow there'd be some lower decibel level after 10 p.m. Um, and then just to be sure that things were very safe um, physically um, through design features and things um, that were implemented to protect patrons in the outdoor areas. Um, they were actually, I think, also very aware that Historic Preservation Board has the ultimate design approval. And so some of this, I think, at least um, item two, and then um, some additional discussion about whether the dining that was with a restaurant needed to be somehow different than the dining with the regular seating for just people who are walking by and want to take a moment to sit down, um, whether there needed to be some distinction. and. Um, you know, staff's opinion, and it's not included in the resolution for this reason, is that um, those things can be managed a number of different ways we've learned from our downtown restaurants. So you've got a really pushy maitre d', or you've got, you know, you ba put barriers in, or the, the chairs are different. And ultimately, um, we didn't think it rose to the level of the condition, but I want to be sure you're fully aware of the discussion that happened regarding that from the boards. Um, the second issue, which is a waiver, um, so the Central Business District defines a series of frontage types um, to make sure that the fronts of our buildings in our downtown are properly engaging with our street and our streetscape. Um, and there is a limitation in this location because Atlantic Avenue is considered a required retail street. And in order to foster a required retail environment, the type of frontage type that you can typically use is limited to storefront or to an arcade with a storefront like the Hands Building. Um, with you know the concept being that um, you know it's going to look like the image on the left, where you know it's sort of this seamless, wide, you know, very shopper-friendly, pedestrian-friendly area. The porch, which is on the right, um, has an elevation to it typically, um, which um, isn't something that we normally would see on you know, our main street. Um, and so the request is to have a waiver from that limitation to storefront and arcade to allow porch. And these are the locations. Um, of course, wrapping that civic open space with the outdoor dining that um, we were just talking about with the conditional use. and then. Um, down at the corner of Southwest First Avenue and Atlantic as well. Um, and ultimately, the considerations for you are um, whether this porch um, has provides a better option. And there are a couple of things in play on this site. Um, there's a pretty significant grade change running east to west on this property. And actually, I remember five years ago when Michelle Hoyland and I both joined the city and this project was originally moving through. We had a number of concerns with the original design as to what was going to happen with the sidewalk and the grade and how was that going to come together for our citizens and our community who are, you know, walking past and, and, and things like that. Um, and to Peb's point earlier in their presentation that they bought the project and then went to work to figure out how to build it. And this is one of the things that they also recognized immediately. So the porch, because by its very nature, it's elevated, you know, it's, it's a different architectural feature than just trying to keep the sidewalk at one level across a block long project. Um, you know, that's part of why they've migrated towards this request. Um, so the porch frontage type does elevate above the sidewalk level. Um, there are also, um, you know, considerations in regard to the district. Vernacular architecture of the area typically had this detail um, at before air conditioning. It was meant to keep the building cooler and um, also provided areas for social interaction, which is part of what required retail, a more lively street is trying to achieve as well. Um, it is a common element in OSHAD's architecture, and um, as they stated, the design um, was inspired by the Cathcart House, which is one of the um, prominent buildings in the district. So what's above is what's in the current approval. The lower image is what's proposed now. Um, this will 
move into Historic Preservation Board's ultimate design authority, but just to give you a quick overview, um, the porches are, like I said, something that's going to be used in companionship with the outdoor dining. Um, one of the biggest concerns with using that type of element that is allowed to encroach into the minimum um, setback is that um, it's only allowed if you can actually maintain that six foot clear zone and you have enough room for landscaping. And um, so that has been fully evaluated in the staff report and they do meet or exceed all of the minimum requirements. I actually think they almost always exceed it. Um, so um, that concern, they've met that criteria. Uh, all three streets have been evaluated. Um, and again, this would, it's not for every spot on the project. Um, there are storefront areas in between that don't have a porch, but this is what it looks like. And again, and again, some of the final detailings related to the actual design of the building will be considered with the certificate of appropriateness and the class three modification that's going before historic preservation board, which ultimately approved will um, appear to this board as an appealable item at some point. So again, the waiver standards, um, you've gotten an overview from um, Mr. Cavalli, they are the same. Um, both sets have to be found to be in compliance to move approval. Um, so again, my understanding was the DDA saw this as a holistic problem on a project on October 11th. Um, HPB also provided a unanimous recommendation of approval for the porch use instead of the, the storefront. Um, and then ultimately, I know there's a lot of interest in this project, so we did want to put up um, that um, if this is approved, then the anticipation is that this will go before the Historic Preservation Board on March 2nd. We have actually re reserved the day after, just in case it goes long after last one that we did on this project. Um, but, um, and of course, if they're not successful in receiving these approvals, then the schedule would probably adjust. But that concludes my presentation, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is a um, quasi-judicial hearing, which means that we allow the public to speak on this particular um, resolution, well, both. Um, so it's uh, resolution 03-22 and 04-22. Anybody who's interested in speaking, please step forward, state your name, address, let everybody know you've been sworn, and we will. George Long, 46 North Swinton. Uh, I had a couple of comments which are in favor. Uh, first of all, I live not too far away, the next block over to the south, next to Dada. And I know there's also, based on my attending the other, other board meetings here, that some of the closer na neighbors to the project might have other concerns. But as far as noise is concerned, uh, not a problem. I, I live right next door to, to, next door to a restaurant. I, I don't hear them over there because I can't hear anything anyway, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's very... It's very, very quiet. It hasn't always been that way. I can tell you some good stories of what I've seen back in the old days, but they're getting boring now. Uh, but anyway, um, so I'm just going to focus on the noise and, and make the statement that I would not anticipate that being a, uh, a problem at all. That when you're talking about noise and you live near Atlantic Avenue and Swinton, it's amplified music that's the thing they're going to hear. And I, I, get, I can tolerate that too, so... Uh, uh, stay focused. Anyway, based on what I've seen here in the other meetings, there's, you don't need to address the whole project over and over. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Long. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening, everyone. Laura Simon from the Downtown Development Authority. Um, just to clarify, so yes, this did come before the DDA in October and was, provide, was presented as a class one originally, but at the meeting they made some um, adjustments and clarification that it was a class three. It was fully you know, vetted and um, ultimately approved 6-0 by the uh, DDA board, and um, we are really looking forward to this project moving forward, so um, we totally support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public comments and um, ask if there's any cross, um, Cross examination by Mr. Cavelli or none. staff? None. And uh, any rebuttal testimony? No. None and none. Okay, very good. To the commission. I have a couple questions before we even start. Just, um, Mr. Cavelli, 
the garbage truck access is that going to also go the same route as I saw that the you know the the yes okay so the same route they'll have the baller they'll be able to yes. make got it okay. there there also is an, another enclosed garbage area in that big enclosed service building that we I showed you that used to just be a walled in area okay on first and they have access to get in off the street there. Okay, and then um, in between the porches along Atlantic, I think it was answered, but just to make sure, we're looking at storefronts there. Yes. So in other words, there's the porches on either end, and then there's storefronts um, on the lower level. And the storefronts fronts actually are in the back of the porches also. Right. So the storefront continues as the porch breaks that Understood. up. Understood. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask um, Anthea. Um, the uh, question that I have as far as the difference between what is at issue here and let's say the, um, the Seagate Hotel. They have um, a porch, they have storefront, but again, they've got their uh, dining and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Why is, is there a difference here because it's in the, the OSHAD district or is it just they got the approval for a waiver and I think they they developed under the previous version of the downtown gotcha. um, code so it was before there was a limitation on that but that's a very good correlation to okay. this um, okay. it's a similar situation I don't think the elevation is quite as high though <laughs> no I think they're a little bit higher over there yeah. now the other thing too is that the civic open space that's all of that yellow area inclusive of where those umbrellas are going to be correct Right, so okay. the um, civic opens, I'm just see if I can get back mm -hmm. to the diagram, that was the best one. It was a yellow, well, it might have been Mr. Cavelli's, but there you go. There we go. I think I still missed it. There it is. But um, yeah, so the civic open space, um, the largest part, there's other smaller ones within the project, but this is part of what's required. And um, so just, just to be, to, to understand, um, we are giving, um, approximately a thousand square feet of a civic space to the private use of the umbrellas, and in lieu of putting um, these uh, on on the, I guess on the a street, if you are the, that's what we're kind of almost like making a trade. Is right. that right? Yes, the LDRs for the Central Business District allow outdoor dining, serving restaurants specifically to be placed inside the civic open space if it's. Um, sort of you know kind of similar amount as what would have found its way into a sidewalk cafe situation just as an incentive to try to keep not just the six foot clear zone but all More. of the street free from um right, chairs while and... still having sort of that you know that lovely environment that atlantic avenue is famous for just to have a broader street to walk down so the civic space is really not the city's however it was negotiated i guess there's a certain requirement for civic open civic space this is no longer open civic space if it was on the avenue we would be charging for that correct well this is private property i so understand you're right. Right. so um it is so the civic open space is let me see if i can say this part is I mean look it's all generally open to the public mm -hmm. it's just that these restaurants are going to serve exclusively you know at these mm -hmm. tables um, it is meant to be publicly accessible but privately maintained open space that's available to the public during daylight hours so you know this one I'm sure you're still going to find somebody eating an ice cream on the bench the side of the fountain even if it's a little bit later in the evening but ultimately um, it's got a multiple purpose. Part of it was to try to break down the mass of the buildings, right? To start moving mm -hmm. in some some open space into downtown that we weren't seeing before. Um, some of it is to, to provide some really great moments in our city. And then um, in this instance, it's also um, playing a role of sort of capturing what would otherwise be a sidewalk cafe within the public right of way and, and encouraging it to locate on private property instead. Okay, so I guess the question that I have is what would prevent all of our civic space to be utilized by somebody that's developing for this purpose. Let's just say that we only had a fraction of this and they wanted to use this as the entire thing for their purpose of, of putting umbrellas out. What, how are we no, not getting into a, you know, a situation where we're setting a precedent that civic space is supposed to be used for civic use, but we're going to allow this particular developer to use it for their own purpose because mm -hmm. you're not going to 
allow for people to sit there unless they're you know, going to the restaurant, I'm sure. And listen, I don't have any problem with this. I'm thinking of this outside of the box and how this is going to potentially be used against the city in the future for a civic space, if you understand what I'm saying. Right, so the, the code isn't super specific on the amount, to be mm -hmm. fair, but it says that you can put a certain amount of outdoor dining that's a similar amount that would have otherwise been able to line the restaurant on mm -hmm. the public right of way. So in this case, they've sort of captured a little bit over here, mm -hmm. sorry, I can't see here, and a little bit over here right. without filling the entire site because, you know, ultimately we would have objected that, you know, we would have started having a configuration war with them. But they, they didn't even try it, to be honest. Right. They, they, they read the code and said, this seems to be about the right size. And then the benefit, too, is that we don't assess parking for Sidewalk Cafe. So by moving it onto private, they have to we're park sure it. that it's parked as well. So that's another benefit as well. Yeah. It's, you know, well, I, I don't have a problem with this. I, I just I understand what you're my saying. My only concern is yeah. that it opens up a door for utilizing civic space in a in a in a manner in which it was not intended. And I don't I know understand. if we're going to have to end up looking at that and maybe you know tightening it down. And this actually is, from my perspective, it's it 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 will activate that space and i think that that's also important so i'm it's not balance though right sure. i'm not yeah. i'm not really upset about this but i just worry about what we're doing for future civic space mm -hmm. um one other thing i just wanted to mention i know that my um some of the board members at the planning and zoning board were very concerned about safety this to me when i was looking at it is very set back i, I the 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 the, the building and then not only that but the trees are going to protect the diners from anything happening I think from a road standpoint I think that was the biggest concern so that doesn't necessarily concern me here because I think that it's kind of almost in and of itself protected it's the building is protecting it up to the sides and then you've also got those trees that are also protecting out front so I'm not as concerned about that as much as I was about the some of the concerns about the civic um, space being the way they utilize it. So that's all I have. And let me start on this end this time. Uh, I, I actually have, uh, I have no questions. No comments? I was going to make a comment that you've already answered. Okay. Yes. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I you did touch on the questions that I had. First of all, I heard six feet. I certainly hope that that's going to be maintained because it's getting to be more and more difficult walking from Swinton to federal you just you take your life in your hands you can't get out into the street because the cars are there which is a good thing so you're single file with your party uh, don't dare have more than two in your party you're going to be single file down the street onto the um, trees that are pushing up into the sidewalk so uh, I'm happy to see that my question is is there a method of some type or another to put into the contract, the, the agreement with the city by this developer that there is going to be an exact location that's measurable. Mm -hmm. uh, so should, I, should our code enforcement need to come out with a measuring tape, you are encroaching on the sidewalk because it's such a popular place, they're overflowing with people, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. However, if you're starting to encroach on the sidewalk, will we have something that will allow our code um, officers to say, no, 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 you're on the city property now. Um, sorry, you, we're going to... I think it is city right property. You. That's the thing. It's more of a... Uh, it's in, in that civic area, and that's what you also have to be concerned with, that it can continue to encroach. If, if they start encroaching, remember, they have to have a site plan approved. We haven't had the site plan approved yet. Okay. And so once that site plan is approved that's what their construction is bound to and that's what ultimately but there will code be sees something encroachment, that's what code will use if in the in the event they want to issue a violation and that is something yeah. specific mm -hmm. yes my additional question mike is um at first um <laughs> avenue and atlantic it appears that it's duplicating atlantic and swinton but there is not going to be any outdoor dining for instance, if a restaurant should come and say, this is a great place, why can't we have it at that location? West Are end. you addressing it now? Or West end of the... The, the west where the, end, where the first, is. southeast no. first. They would have to modify it. West first. So if they were to come... I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the better graphic, but it showed the whole project. I don't remember where I was. I saw um, it. So if it was going to... Um, 
go to the other porch. I, this is what I was looking for. You're saying yes, down here. That's a good one. Yes. Right down here. So they would have to modify the conditional use to have that area added to the exhibit. The resolution actually limits it to that piece. And the other thing in terms of being able to measure it for clean and safe crew or someone like that, um, I'm sure that we, if it's not already indicated on the site plan approval, the area, it's, it's labeled as 500 square feet, but I'm sure we can add dimensions to it so that it'd be very easy for, you know, our crew to say, well, it's only supposed to be this 10 feet by 20 something, <laughs> sorry, 20 by whatever the math is, yeah. So, um, so we can, because um, keep in mind, if you're okay with the outdoor dining at night, then it goes to HPB, and so we can make sure that the certified set indicates a dimensioned area on it so that it's easier to enforce over time. Very good, thank you. The question that uh, the mayor uh, was interested in is, if someone does not want to dine at either of the, either of the restaurants and they want to eat an ice cream cone, um, is it designated enough so that you'll feel comfortable using you said benches or some colored chairs. I can see a problem wherein I might not know that I can't sit at this table with this beautiful umbrella because it belongs to the restaurant. I, I just foresee perhaps a visitor not quite knowing that unless there's a name on the umbrella with the restaurant on it. How, would, how, how is a person to know that they can't occupy it? I guess it'll be a constant coming up to the, the way the service staff coming up saying, here's the menu and then you have to vacate well that's I'm what concerned we, about right i mean this this is part of what came up with planning and zoning board so if you are sitting on the edge of this fountain eating an ice cream cone that you bought at docks um you know I'm, you're gonna be fine um there's benches there's bike racks there's other things that are generally available this discussion of whether there had to be a barrier, a required barrier, or whether it would be roped off, or whether the tables and chairs would be a different style than the other tables and chairs. These are things that we can work with them. You over. said tables and chairs. There will be tables and chairs? In the, for the outdoor dining? They are only going to belong to the restaurant, correct? You're not going to have any right, but they, maybe chairs, or maybe. tables, rather, for Citizens. There's benches as well. No, there are bench requirements. You can, they are located. The civic open space does have to have a certain amount of seating for the public. That part is provided around the fountain, and there's benches, and uh, there's a pet waste station, there's a water fountain. There's certain things that are required elements just for passers by. The, the areas that are the two 500 and square foot areas for outdoor dining, and then the areas on the porches. Um, controlling who sits at those tables, I think is a little bit of micromanagement from a planning level. I'm sure that the restaurant management will figure out how to make sure the people sitting there are customers. <laughs> and, and honestly, if there are adjustments needed over time, like adding landscape barriers or something like that, um, that's something that we can work with them um, at, a, at a level lower than the commission, either administratively or through the HPV board. So Just anticipating future yeah. con problems with our police officers and clean and safe and just trying to make it comfortable for everyone. Well, they are hearing problems. all of your concerns. If there's anything you want to exactly. add, you can jump up, but it's, it has come up at the other board, so I'm I understand sure. it. Yeah. And I, I just was concerned about the safety when something's happening and at that particular time, a point rather, the traffic may be slowing up to cross Swinton, but if you become distracted and safety and I'm watching something and I'm driving towards it unconsciously, of course, but uh, I would be very concerned about that. But if, you if appear I, if to I have um, in, in, it. in regards to your your concern, um, we're negotiating with different restaurants right now, and and they all have talked about some kind of planter dividers, um, not really stanchions. So. Part of what we, I, I guess, the, the pushback of, of not designating that is, you know, as you get the, these restaurants, they all have their own style, their own character, and they're going to come up with something to control that. So we, we're trying not to, like, lock it into one specific thing mm -hmm. so that they, they have that flexibility as they negotiate leases. My basic question or concern would be that the restaurants encroach on what you, we, are thinking is public. So that's, that's my concern. Thank you. It's all. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cassell? 
No, I mean, you asked most of the questions. I appreciate the fact that the um, dining where it is, that's the requirement for the parking as well. Um, when we were looking at this, and I realize this isn't what it's ultimately going to be, we're seeing a lot of on-street parking. Is that on-street parking? Anthea, the mayor usually asks this question, but I'm going to today. Incorporated into the project? No. no. Okay, no. thank you. That's great. Um, but I understand what Ms. Johnson is saying. We're taking our we're taking property that passersby might use and sit in. It's okay. And uh, we're giving it to them to use. And, you know, so we're taking from something from the residents ultimately. Within the project, is there other recreational civic space from the overview? I know there's, I remember meeting with the gentleman, and the project is lovely. But I guess to Ms. Johnson's point, is there another place within the project where you could add civic space for? There's that promenade. That's mm -hmm. so, right. yeah, the whole entire, entire entry. Entire, there's a huge area. Uh, I think it's a, no, that's a construction sequence. That's not you. Oh, Sorry, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Sorry, I, listen, I'm for the project. I'm just asking. Is there a presentation for this one? Mm. Yeah, no, that's just mine, I think. Yes, yeah. please. It's okay if you can't. It's fine. And you see all the secret slides. And a side note, not important though, but I do, I like the size of the columns. I don't necessarily think they need to be reduced. <laughs> this is my two cents, irrelevant, but thank you. In, in response to your, to, to your comment, you know, the, the whole purpose of doing this internal pedestrian paseo yes. was, was actually to provide, you know, common space for, for everyone. And, right. you know, one of the, the things that we did to improve this was we actually added the, the elevators and the stairway so people could park in the parking garage, mm -hmm. get them out of their cars, right. and put them on foot, and, and they can go anywhere through this project mm -hmm. or anywhere else in town. Perfect. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Deputy Vice Mayor? Sure. Motion to approve Resolution 03 <laughs> <laughs> Second. <laughs> Okay, uh, is there anything else anybody else wanted to say, or are we good? All right, so let's call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Motion to approve, 04-22. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. I was going to say, Mr. Cavelli, you, you had my heart in my throat when you started your speaking about the movement of all the, the buildings. I thought, we cannot be back to that. <laughs> that was truly, I thought that that's where you were starting. I thought, oh my gosh, here we go again. So anyway, that was, uh, I, I, hope my, you were I was surprised. palpitating, but then all of a sudden I realized that was the old. I hope you were surprised. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> pleasantly. Okay, so resolution number 25-22 also includes the Sunday Village. Yes. This one is um, this is a sequence of a the... bit unique. It's not something we usually need to bring to, to you. Um, and I'm going to um, well, this is an applicant request. I think it's also a staff necessity um, because there were a series of, as you know, as you well know, there were a series mm -hmm. of approvals um, for what was then known as Swinton Commons Midtown. Um, involving uh, multiple actions, conditional use requirements, um, alley abandonments, um, the actual COA and um, project approval, each had conditions attached to it. And um, we find ourselves in a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. And we would like to forge a sequence that everyone can agree on to allow the project to move forward. So um, do you want to go sure. from your perspective and we'll make sure our perspectives sure. match? Or? I'll, uh... <laughs> I'll carry on and you can fill in the blanks. How's All that? Right. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, again, you, you, you've seen this in terms of where the project is. We are now um, going to talk about Block 69, which is just south of the Federspiel Garage on First Avenue. Um, this is a certified plan for, for that area, and part of that certified plan was that the alley needed to be extended. Uh, as you know, right now it comes around the west side of Fetterspiel and goes east to First Avenue. Mm -hmm. This probably gives you a little better idea. You can see, um, let's see if I can do this. Hey, um, you see, and, and it, it runs east and west right in that area. That area was abandoned. 
uh, and, and subject to that abandonment was to, to reconstruct this. As you can see, this house is in the way of building that, so this is where the sequencing co comes into play. Um, let me give you a better, better view. We'll remove the house, um, start, with, start this alley construction, we'll put a barrier in north of this east-west existing area. We'll, we'll put a uh, temporary ingress-egress easement that will need to be recorded that has some dissolving language that once the new alley's built, it goes away so we're not before you with an abandonment later on. Um, and, and, and that will maintain traffic flow um, in, the, in the alley behind Fetterspiel. Um, it gives us the ability to remove the existing alley pavement that runs east and west while we're building the new alley. And then at the end, all of those will go away and the alley will be, be existing north and south and that will complete the obligation of that resolution. How's that? Okay, so I'm gonna take it a little further. Okay. Um, all right, so if I can see mine. Look quickly. Sorry, listen to me. Chop, chop. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Raphael. <laughs> All right, so mine is a little brief. I want to show you the language in the resolution um, as well. Um, so, again, this is a project that spans four blocks. It had multiple approvals related to it, and the resolution before you, um, through Michelle Hoyland and Lynn Jallen and me, we have traced the approval route for this project and ultimately here's what's happened is that the abandonment of this alley requires the connection to make its way all the way through to first however to do that there's a building in the way however i can't issue a building permit to demolish a historic structure until a building permit for the positive construction is in hand, which requires a plat. And it can't plat until they make the alley connection, which is in the way. <laughs> and so ultimately, it's this circular system. And I am personally not willing to interpret the code to say that building any kind of roadway through a historic building constitutes positive construction. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> That's, um, I just think that could be a scary interpretation to say that building a road is the same as building a building. So what is before you now gives us a route through um, getting this project underway. Um, the first is that um, we will um, have a, uh, once we have a, a reasonable submittal for a new alley um, construction to city standards because this will be part of a public alleyway um, which includes bonding requirements when you work in a public right-of-way and all of that um, then um, once that is in hand and we are we have the permission to issue that we will allow building Z which has already been approved for removal under the previous site plan approval once that building is out of the way and we are working towards um, you know, that new right-of-way connection, a plat can be recorded um, following the HPB approval because the plat needs to reflect everything that's coming through that you just looked at. Um, the pedestrian passageway, the vehicular drop-off, all of this will come together into one nice, nice, nice neat plat. <laughs> and um, once we've recorded the plat, then we will be able to issue building permits for the new construction of um, the um, project that I, I believe is going to start on Block 61. Um, and because this proposal now um, suggests um, rather than moving the houses into a temporary location and then putting them back down again in another location, the, the sequence is intended to take some of those buildings that have to move and move them directly onto their permanent new foundations, that that too would constitute positive work because we would finally have those buildings moving towards real rehabilitation. Um, and that the other historic structures that are already approved for demolition and removal would once a, um, once these 
things happen would be able to come down following, you know, which is the LDR um, requirement in the code when it comes to historic buildings. We don't tear them down until the new stuff is coming because sometimes, as we all know, the new things don't come, so we hold on to them. Um, so this, we think, provides us a way out. The only thing, uh, Ms. Jellen, that I don't have in this, that we need to decide if we need to add, is the temporary easement across the abandoned alleyway that Mr. Cavalli um, included in his presentation. I don't have that in the sequencing, so if we want to add that, we need to and move approval with that adjustment as well added. And then we'll go from there. So question, why would we allow for the demolition before the plat? Why wouldn't we reverse that two and three? They're required, um, the, uh, they're required to record a plat. They cannot record a plat with our new public right of way with a building halfway in it. We're, it has to be clear. Um, okay. And so that's part of where gotcha. we've gotten into all kinds of. Got it. I know. Please. Um, <laughs> the the, the plat is a condition. The pat, as we said, the plat is a condition of approval. Um, it's got to be done before the alley spilled. It all. It's literally a chicken and an egg. So when you start looking at the warehouse clauses, they're laid out. Okay. So um, worst case scenario, we demo and. And things aren't done after that. What 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 is the? Well, the first step is that we actually get the bond for completing the alley, the north south alley that we, All right. you know, that the that it's going to be built to our city standards. That improvement, like any work in a public right of way, is bonded so that if it doesn't get sure. completed, that our own public works team will finish the job properly. Right. <laughs> so you got it. Okay. So yeah. So that, that that's this is I the wanted. way through we've found and I understood and and support it. Thank you, Mayor. I just have two questions, I hope. Um, did the HPB state the historic significance of this building? It's been so long, I don't remember what they what their recommendation was for that building. That's my number one question. I will tell you that the approved plan that is on the books that can be built today has this building leaving. That's I, where leaving, what it was demolished, demolished ha where it was originally Five no years ago, in the scheme of things, it has a certified site plan that says this building is being removed. Very good. I and know there were some that yeah, they were right. fighting hard to keep, and yes. the commission said, uh, tell us why, and they couldn't. So I think we said, get rid of it. Again, with the, um, I think you said fines, not fines, but bond, mm -hmm. there's a time frame. Do we say the, this agreement is only good for two years? so that maybe three years down the road when we're not sitting here, someone will say, well, why didn't you stop them after two years? I mean, um, hypothetically. <laughs> All right, I, I know there's, there's a limit on the plat, there's a limit on the site plan approval, there's a limit on everything. I'm not clear on, on the bonding time frame. It would just follow the standard city process. Um, but ultimately, um, they really cannot move forward without this. And so I think that the anxiousness to be sure that something can move forward is actually more on the applicant. Have, have they, they given us a time frame when this project <coughs> will begin, or it's just out there? And I'm going to let Mr. Cavelli answer that somehow. question. Somehow, <laughs> they have to get an approval. So. <laughs> um, we're working very diligently, um, I believe. We did all the structural plans yesterday, right? Uh, Friday. Uh, Friday, we submitted the the building plans for all of the underground for Block 61. So we're, we're moving a, as fast as we can. The design plans for, for the alleyway are just about completed, so those will be done. The demolition plan for the house ha or, uh, application has been filed with the building department. So we're, we're looking to really go. That We're just kind of stuck in this in this circular it used to be called catch 22 yes thank you that's it Mr. Cassell nothing Device. motion to approve Mr. Commissioner um, Boylston no. let me ask another question because I Come didn't at the last at the last one real quick <laughs> the um the porch to the west is that a, that's not a restaurant right that's um 
I can disclose to you that we're in negotiations with a bank right now. Okay. I just was curious because I'm wondering, <laughs> I was wondering about that sidewalk also, and I'm concerned about that. That's the reason why I meant to ask that, and then everybody kind of moved. I, if I may, very quickly, uh, you, you heard me say that there's a curb, a planter, and then a small wall. Yeah. The wall is, is for the purpose of raising the sidewalk. Gotcha. So that there's ADA access to mm -hmm. all of the storefronts, and the porches by code have to have an eight inch step, but the ends of the porches have handicap ramps. Gotcha. So the whole thing is accessible now. On the certified plan, if you were in a wheelchair, you would have to go all the way to Atlantic and Swinton intersection oh, wow. and come back, back through to get in. Now you have access gotcha. from anywhere you Perfect. want. Perfect. All right, sounds good, thank you. All right. Um, I made a motion, but was I supposed to incorporate additional language that you just mentioned? Yes, for discussion, if you wanted to include the easement, we would just ask that you allow staff to administratively amend the resolution um, consistent with what Ms. G. Notice uh, informed you. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. All the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Get that thing going. Absolutely. All right, so moving on to development review process, 7D. A lot of you, Anthea. I know, right? Too much, probably. Um, so we have started to move forward with um, beginning to implement project docs um, with InterGov, which is going to move us um, into this century. Um, so, um, We've had this discussion several times in relate, regard to our process for development approval um, and a number of other things. Um, it's going back to 2015. Uh, there was another discussion again, I think, in 2019. And so now uh, I'm raising some of these discussions again because if there is an appetite to make any changes, um, that discussion needs to start happening now. Um, Currently, we have five classes of site plan, class one, two, three, four, and five. Class one does not necessarily mean it is administrative. It includes architectural changes that face um, the city or face um, a right of way. So those require board, re board review, and then the rest of them tend to just be administrative. Um, it's also, I think, important to note that um, the class three is a modification which represents a change in intensity or use. It doesn't say a, a, an increase in intensity, right? It's a change. So even if someone is coming in and they're doing a smaller building than what was approved, we're, we're like back to the board. Um, or, it's, or it's just viewed at the same level of review, which is you know, usually aimed at more, right? You're trying to bring in more. So what, what does that mean for us? Um, so um, ultimately, we're trying to figure out if, if we can simplify the categorizations of what we're evaluating, and then we need to talk about how we're gonna evaluate them. The first is, um, the simplest option is, is if we could move to a, a major minor um, organization where those uh, sort of smaller changes, you're changing something in a landscape plan, it meets code, um, you're updating a parking lot, um, you know, something like that where it's not having a significant change. Some of those things require going before the SPRAB now, and they're, they're relatively simple. So could we combine class ones and twos into what we would call a minor? Could we combine class threes, fours, and fives into something um, considered a major for a board review? Option two, we're gonna get crazy, <laughs> is um, could we go beyond that and start to talk about um, at what point a threshold, what is the threshold for actual new development that um, would require um, consideration as a major which has um, a full review of um, performance standards and other things versus something that is minor. Um, so we've looked at other cities and we've sort of considered our city and so I'm putting forward to you that perhaps we would categorize anything less than or equal to eight new units as a minor, something less than 10,000 square feet or equal to, and then majors being um, anything greater than that, and additions being something that agglomerates it to that, something more. So there's two choices here, and we could take it in steps where we could just say, all right, everything we considered a class one and two before is now considered a minor, and everything considered more than that is a major, or else we could define new thresholds. 
I know this is going to take more conversation than just today. So here's examples from some of our neighbors. Um, Boynton Beach considers anything less than 10 units a minor, anything more. Um, Jupiter's got just almost a crazy commercial level because they are very different than us. So two acres, anything under two acres, they do as a minor. And their minors are administrative approval. I, I don't know that we're ready for that, but you know, so. Um, so anyway, if there, is there a way to categorize the, the development and the redevelopment that comes in into something simpler than five levels of site plans where there isn't a big descriptive understanding necessarily between some of the ones in the middle? Um, the other thing, and we heard a lot about this, I think, from the Economic Task Force during um, our COVID shutdowns, which was when we weren't able to have board meetings, was there a way to streamline some of what we still take to a board? Um, so some things are, you know, you've been through the boards, you've gotten an approval from SPRAB, and, um, you know, you're going to building permit, and now something small has to adjust. It's not going to exactly match the certified set. Is there um, a percentage where we wouldn't have to take it back through a board for approval if it's a slight adjustment within a certain threshold? Um, the other thing is that, you know, if instead of, increasing square footage if there it, or at least if the, if it is a reduction like I got approved for you know a 7,000 square foot building but I'm only but I'm shifting it a little you know I'm shifting it just a little and now it's only going to be a 6,000 square foot building do we need to go back to the board or can we process that that site plan um, modification administratively um, we have a lot of concern about changing approved um, landscape plans if we have a code if you if you tried to work with an oak tree and it failed and you want to put in, um, I'm not good with trees, but let's say a laurel oak instead of a live oak, you know, can we have our landscape, our senior landscape planner or arborist or somebody make that judgment call that it's a like for like without having to modify the, the site plan through a board process? Some fences go to boards, others don't. Um, we have a lot of folks that bring in a change in roof material. You know, the, the, sh the shingles were this color, and now they're going to shift to that color. And then awning changes. The structure is there. Um, they want to change the color. Um, it's gotten old, or it's a new tenant. Do we need to, to does, does, that, does that really rise to the level of having to, you know, get on a board agenda and, and take a month? Um, so, for example, the pictures on the right are before and after that required board approval. Do we see the change? Does everybody see which one? What we went to Sprab and we took, it's this. That's the awnings. That they went from that color to that color. They didn't change shape. They didn't change location. Um, so in January, January alone, the planning side, not the building. We spent a lot of time talking about building lately, but the planning side had 82 distinctive requests. Either I need a zoning verification letter or I'm going all the way through to a, a Class five for a new um, for a new building. So, all right, color. Okay, we have guidelines for color in our historic preservation guidelines. Some of the styles in the central business district architectural guidelines, and the BPOA guidelines for single family in those areas have some reference for color and material. All other judgments on color that are being considered by our boards are subjective. We have no guidelines. Um, so last year, we had 27 applications for color changes. Keep in mind, the color is reviewed as part of the overall new development. Now someone has come in and they want to paint their building. And so if it is not single family or duplex, it goes into this broad board. Um, HPB is a little different, and just for the just for the sake of this presentation, HPB is kind of not in this conversation. There's a level of streamlining already because HPB has some powers for variances and waivers when they're looking at those projects. So I'm really talking about SPRAB, PZB, and BOA actions right now. Um, so out of those 27 applications, that um, all of them were approved. Two were asked to make some adjustments and come back. And there was an overall concern of the graying of Delray Beach. If you haven't noticed, gray is very popular right now. Um, I would have never thought that black would become such a popular p 
paint color, but I live in a historic district, not in the city, and there are three black houses now, and they are beautiful. So I would have knee-jerk reacted and said, no, we should not allow black, but you know, this is the trend. Black paint for home exteriors is the latest design trend. These are swatches from, I believe, it might have been, it was the mark. Okay, I was gonna say Caspian, I was wrong. Um, where, you know, 24 of the 29 units cast a ballot and unanimously picked this. So I'm just starting to wonder if there's a way to not take a month long board approval and staff time for some of these changeable elements. It's just a thought. Um, and if we're going to keep it, then we probably need to adopt some standards um, because it's, it's very subjective. So one of the other considerations is we currently work with four boards. We have SPRAB, HPB, PZB, and the Board of Adjustment. Most of our neighbors have fewer boards, and largely that is due to that the zoning part of the Board of Adjustment, variances to setback and things like that is actually handled by the planning board, um, which in a way has some, has some good, good um, I think, uh, connection because the planning board actually reviews LDR amendments. And so if the board that's considering your code is actually seeing the variances, then they start to under help us determine where the code needs to change. Um, the other part that the Board of Adjustment hears are appeals from um, the Chief Building Official's interpretation of the Florida Building Code. In 11 years, we've had one. <laughs> so, um, so we wanted to look in to see if there was a way to um, you know, coordinate with the county to see if their Construction Board of Appeal would be a resource for us in the event that another one occurs. Um, so anyway, that's something to think about moving forward. Um, and I do want to say that our board members are rock stars. These people sit through very long meetings. They are giving their time. They are not paid, you know. And um, sometimes, you know, they are this having to deal with people who are not happy with what's coming forward. And so um, it is hard to find um, sometimes the architect, the developer, the real estate agent, the, you know, the boards are all um, required to have a certain amount of expertise. And so, um, you know, this is nothing in any way, shape, or form that is critical of our current board members because we have a really great group. Um, so right now, the way that uh, our thing works is that we have, you know, the five classes of site plan. If you're not asking for waivers or conditional use, you um, go to SPRAB or you go to HPB, and then ultimately, this will find itself onto an appealable report for this board. And if there's something that um, you're not comfortable with or you're worried has more impact than what's considered, you have the ability to reach down and we hear the item as a Genova item. If there is relief, if there's waiver or in lieu, that has to come to city commission before there can be an action. What you just saw with Sunday Village, they needed a waiver and a conditional use. So they went to actually HPB for recommendation to PZB, then they went to PZB, then they went to city commission. Um, if there was a variance to a setback, if it's outside of a historic district, it goes to the Board of Adjustment. Once those things are in order, it can go to SPRAB or HPB, and then it finds its way as, as an appealable item. And I think some of what has come up through comments through some of the boards is whether there's an opportunity um, for a more holistic review. The Planning and Zoning Board is charged with conditional use. That's when you're getting more density, you're getting more height. But they're not looking at the site plan. The only place that that happens is the Central Business District, which requires that this board actually approve those density increases looking at the site plan altogether. Um, so is there a way to move those requests that affect density or height or that site plan together to um, it would have to be the Planning and Zoning Board because they're the local planning agency, so they're required by their state to have that function. Sorry, I was thinking that out. Um, so, and sometimes when you're talking about how to ameliorate impacts, the design of what is coming with it matters. And so that disconnect that we sort of resolved in downtown still exists in other places, and is there an opportunity to put that together? There's a lot of ways we can look at this. We could you know, um, 
have SPRAB maintain the majors and the minors that don't have that conditional use function and move the ones that do have a conditional use relationship to height to density over to planning and zoning board. Keeping in mind, planning and zoning board is maintaining their rezoning, their land use amendments, the LDR um, requirements that they have and maintain the appeal. Um, you know, is there, are we moving minors to administrative? I had to put it in there. I know you're not, I don't think our community is ready for that, but hey, it's, it's the way a lot of our neighbors function and, ma and majors are going to one board. Um, is the major recommendary um, action that then is approved by city commission, and you would need another meeting date each month, but this is the way some places work, and I, I just need to bring it to you. So there's a lot of there's a lot of choices, and then the last one is you know does um, does Sprad then oversee minors and adjustments to existing building, and PZB oversees you know just new development. Um, there's a lot to think about, um, and I don't know that you're going to be able to give me direction today, but if we're going to have a workshop or we're going to start moving forward, yeah. I need to. I th we need to have the discussion now. Otherwise, we're just going to move on, keep our five, you know, and, and keep going. One of the issues that's come up a lot recently is whether we need to add a revocation of conditional use and that process, and that's something we've begun to research with the city attorney's office, and we do think that there's a route forward for that. Um, there are some actions that we are taking to boards that are really purely ministerial. Once you have approved a project, like the project we just saw, and the plot is ready to come, you know, it's implementing an approved site plan. Can it just come to city commission? Planning and zoning board in the past has sort of complained that, you know, sometimes they don't always, they didn't see the site plans, and so this is, what are they supposed to do with this? And they move it along. Not this board that's seated now, but I'm saying this has been a complaint in the past five years that I've been here. So is there a way to take a step out that is, you know, purely ministerial? Um, and then, um, Land use amendments. Um, we're a city that's growing through redevelopment. We don't have pasture land to pave or, you know. So um, we also have other policies that really limit changing residential land use or zoning um, without some sort of neighborhood or redevelopment plan in place to guide that. And so finally, we just suggest that um, moving land use amendments to a supermajority, I think, would stabilize and maintain some predictability for our community but it also means that we have a unified vision when we do change it or fairly unified because you know four to one 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 person's out but um but it's something to consider this is um actually in boca raton's charter so this this does happen in other places um because you shouldn't change your land use plan lightly it opens the door to multiple zoning applications and so um, or, I mean, zoning districts as an implementation. So this is something that we thought should be considered at this point as well. So there might be some things here that we have consensus on today. There might be some things we have no consensus on today. <laughs> and um, there might be some things you want to discuss more, in which case we really do need to plan to make time for this as soon as we can just to, to be able to move, like I said, this, this program forward. Um, do we want to keep regulating color and material? Um, do you want a supermajority for land use map changes? Um, should we pursue the revocation of conditional use? Uh, should we consider transferring Board of Adjustments duties to Planning and Zoning Board? And it's you know one less board to maintain and run and have to find talented people who are willing to donate their time. Um, and should we shift to a major minor? And even if that answer is yes, I suspect finding the threshold for that and where we think that falls probably is gonna take a larger discussion. So this is kind of what I wanted to bring up. Thanks. Four hours in and this is what we're talking about. Like, I know, I know. I think we um, just need to I have to tell you, this is so complex and so complicated and so beyond, I think, any one of our abilities. I don't think, I don't know that any of us have served on any of these boards. And I think that's very, very important that we take it in consideration because I don't know how this is going to affect. I don't. I don't know what the ripple effect is, effect is going to be, but I'll bet you those board members do, um, especially those that have been, you know, several times on the board or even a previous board member. They would probably have a better understanding as to how this would affect 
how things are going through. I know you probably have a little bit of that too, but these are some pretty big questions. Um, I, I, I think that it, to me, I, I would like to, there's, there's nothing on here that anybody's willing to step into and say that they would agree to. I would like to just say that we need to have, we need to talk about this in a, in a workshop meeting. I mean, I, I think it's just, it's, it's intense. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, it's, there's a lot of things in here and they're, and they're interworking with each other. And it, you know, there, I was even thinking when I was looking through this, that maybe we, maybe we don't get a, rid of the BOA. Maybe we, you know, merge because merged Sprav into BOA right. or something to that effect. My thoughts are that, again, I don't know what that is going to look like and how that will affect that board and if they'll be able to get what they need to get done and does it conflict. There's a lot of questions that I can't answer, but I think that we would, if we prepare and are able to talk to some of the board members, we can get a better understanding. I know we did get a message from um, one of the chairs mm -hmm. from the Sprav board who felt very strongly that we did things the way that we have them because they, they, it works that way. But again, I don't think that there's any reason why we can't consider narrowing it down. When you looked at that map of other cities, when you were, had, had them, if you notice, majority of the cities that basically have HPB also have two other boards. Besides the planning board, because everybody has to have the planning board pretty much. But what I'm saying is, is that, well, I guess it doesn't have to. But anyway, most have the planning board. So they're, most of them with the HPB have four. The cities that don't have HPB don't have historic areas for the most part, right? Because they don't need a right, historic right. No, board. Absolutely. So absolutely. that's your fourth board there. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, we can't obviously get rid of our historic board. That's no. one of the you know, founding, so, and planning board is required, yes, by state, right. okay, so you're really looking at the other two boards, and so. I think it's not so much that, is that some of these other places um, have absorbed all of their requests into that one board hearing, okay. everything. Um, but I would like to talk to the board members that are there saying, can you handle this, because there is such detail in the SPRAB board Meet, you know hearings that you know are is not part of that that uh, planning board hearing. So you know, can they handle both, and do they want to handle both? I don't know that. I, I can't answer that. I just don't want to go from right from this to worse. But I can tell you that I agree that we have to look at this, and here's the reason why: we have limited number of people with professions that are willing to serve their time, to serve time in the city. So when we're stretching that out across several boards, you become almost like depleted. You don't even have the numbers that you need a lot of times. So that's another reason why we really should consider this, but I just, it's I don't have the bandwidth to do okay. it tonight. Sorry. I barely do too. <laughs> so. I'd just Vice like Mayor. to chime in. I'd like to see perhaps a little bit more on to the administrative part, we might be encumbering our committees, our boards rather, with actions that could be done at an administrative level. Well, yeah, that's what I think I we totally were I agree that we do need a workshop. Yeah. Okay. Could I? Like, um, yes, oh, I'm sorry. Kazan. Anthea, could you slide back a few slides for me, please, though? Right there. Thank you. The streamlining. Because some of this, though, I agree with you on the boards, but some of this would be easy to say sh exchanging one tree for a different type of tree shouldn't be a, a problem. Parking lot improvements, you know, fences and walls. And even the reductions, I would say on the 10% or less, that would be dependent on the size of the project, right? So if it was a Sunday Village, 10% is pretty substantial. I might not be amenable to that. But if you're talking about a single family home project or a smaller project, 10%. But I think this could help our residents, and it wouldn't necessarily uh, change anything with us. So these streamline opportunities, I am definitely in favor of. As I said about the 10%, that would be dependent on project size. Mm -hmm. But with the, I am definitely in favor of a uh, supermajority on a land use amendment. 
and I would be willing to say that here today. And I think we should all. You're talking be. about the zoning, right? Is that what that land is? use? Yeah. For land use. Land, land use. use. Okay. So let me just say this about these smaller things. I would, I would, I would still say we can do that very quickly and easily. Talk to the boards that are dealing with it, and then make that decision. Because when we got that email from um, Todd, Todd LaHaro, he basically said, you know, what they're able to do is to make sure that we're not just one blanket, you know, gray look, because gray is in, so everybody wants to do gray. He, he, you know, on these boards, they can say, there's too much gray in that area. Right. There's too much yellow in that area. Right. And not allow it so that we don't have just a slate you know, of a whole block of gray, because that's the popular color. Everybody wants it. So it, it may be able to be done administratively. Will it be done to the liking of the city? I don't know. When you're, when you're a board member and you have a, you know, a, what I'm trying to say is we can make that decision, but talk to some of the people that are making these decisions mm -hmm. and then find out if, in fact, they're doing something that's really actually beneficial to the city that we, right. we don't even recognize right? because of the ripple effect is what I'm trying to say. So anyway. Understand. So on to the super majority. Uh, I think it's favorable. I think we should really consider it. We just amended our comprehensive plan. We have a new land use map that we're looking at, and we should be very thoughtful when we are changing that. And I, I, I move for the super majority on that. Okay. Um, Deputy Vice Mayor. Thank you. Anthea, this is a um, great and long overdue presentation. Um, while I know some of my colleagues commented about the board members, I think we all also lose sight on staff time, whether it be your department, the city attorney's office, they're working from 8.30 to 5, and by the way, they have to be here from 6 to 11. Mm. That's a lot. And then, oh, by the way, they're coming in the next day, and they have to prepare. And th th there's a lot of time mm -hmm. that is spent uh, and un unrecognized uh, by many. And... I also think that the members of these boards, um, the quality has gone down, not for any particular reason, but there's ethics requirements, financial requirements, education requirements, this requirement, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, anything that can be streamlined and, uh, and make your jobs easier, I, I would be a proponent of. Um, I think it would be very important, can't believe I'm gonna agree with Shirley, but have a workshop. Yeah. But, I think you need to meet individually with all five of us. Okay. Um, and I think it should maybe have been done before you did this because yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and through no fault to anyone, it's just a lot. So prior to any workshop, at least I think we need individual meetings because there could be some things uh, that we could agree on. Okay. Uh, regarding the supermajority, today as we sit, I may not be in favor of that because the biggest thing we have in our city is the hiring and removal of our city manager, that's not a super majority. So I don't know if I would go that far, but I would mm -hmm. absolutely agree to any uh, opinions that your department, the, the city attorney's department, and Mr. Moore, I'm not looking to get rid of you, just for the record. <laughs> but I, I just think it's very complicated. There's many issues. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, anything that would go to help staff and the boards, uh, any kind of streamlining, I would be in favor of that. And I thank you for the great presentation. Mr. Boston. So I'm in favor of this entire process. <laughs> um, and yeah, there are things in there that I could just give you a, a, a yay on, and there's things I could do nay, and there's other ones I have to do more research on. So I'm um, with my colleagues. Um, that we need probably a workshop or individual okay. meetings if that is the best way to kind of tackle this. Um, and then that way we can all have, um, you know, individual conversations. I believe the chair, the um, chair of our P and Z was on board of adjustments. Yes. Right. So, right. You know, he could probably tell you whether or not he thinks that'll work. Exactly. But I, um, have the so like I never have had the opportunity to speak. Because Todd Larue's email really, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't think about a few of those things. I didn't either. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. So, yes, ma'am, Mr. Larue is is one of our best board chair so yes. it was really not he wrote a no, great any would have been here he wrote a great um yes, I you know, email well. and he also pinned it up i think on facebook which i thought was really important because mm -hmm. it was something i would have never thought of i thought Oof, nothing but then he mentioned it and i was like wow you know what that's I never thought of that because i'm not on that board yes ma'am just one last um item we're going to ask our 
board members to attend, so it might be a little difficult, but we'll encourage them if they would please give us their input via an email if they are not able to come. I'm all for the workshop. I think the public should be allowed to chime in on this, as they sometimes are often asking us to do. All right. Actually, it was, I think you guys also gave me a great idea to seek the board members that have been on more than one board. I think it was a really good suggestion. So we will regroup and get to work. Sounds Thank great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. Moving on to 7E, which is the ratification of emergency regulations. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Petolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. All right, and we are now at 9A, which is our public hearing, and that is ordinance number 01-22. Ordinance of the City First reading, so I'm sorry. Sorry. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning approximately 1.78 plus or minus acres of land located south of West Atlantic Avenue and west of South Military Trail from Planned Office Center, POC District, to General Commercial GC District for the property located at 5200 West Atlantic Avenue. As more particularly described herein, amending City of Delray Beach zoning map July 6, 2021, providing a conflict clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. And as you said, Mayor, this is first reading. I don't think this is a public hearing, though. No, I'm sorry. I meant, meant And um, there's no presentation. This was right. done after our right. rule change. Uh, any motions? Motion to approve. Second. All the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Moving on to comments and inquiries. City Manager? Nothing further at this time. Thank you. City Attorney? Nothing. To the Commission? Are we on start? Nothing. You're in? I just had Go one, right ahead. One, one quick thing. Um, I was wondering if my colleagues would be interested in getting an update from staff on the three blocks of Atlantic that is west of Swinton. You and my colleague probably remember a few years ago, we sat down with consultants and they showed us um, how they were going to change it from two lanes to a lane and so that it wasn't so sudden that it goes from four to two lanes right at Swinton. It was going to be like a progression. Mm -hmm. And we had several meetings and they showed us different concepts, but then that project was like dead. And I thought about it tonight when I'm looking at the, the um, um, Swinton project and, uh, and I'm not sure what happened with that. You, got, you recall that? I do, but I, I mean, are you talking about narrowing it down or... It was, it took three blocks. It took like three blocks to get to, go from four to two was like the strategy or two, maybe it was two blocks that, that it took rather than it going right from four to two. And we were working with consult consultants. I think FDOT was involved. Um, and right, but I mean. Nothing well, I think, ever happened. I don't, I don't think anything happened because it was, I don't think it was well received because we're talking about trying to get traffic from, you know, West, I mean, East Atlantic out, and to narrow it down, we would be, you know, kind of almost choking it a little bit in that area. See, I, I don't recall the narrowing, but I remember the beautification, and I, I think it was Miss Johnson who brought up about when you're trying to, as a pedestrian, cross the street. It's like you're taking your life in your. That, that's all of that area in, <laughs> yeah. on on the on that in that one corner, Swinton to Atlantic. There were which, extreme versions that I know we weren't in favor, like of putting a right. roundabout in, and like I know there was extreme versions. I think the last thing I saw was slight changes to try to get some of the traffic to turn left. You, you know right who you should speak to is is um, Missy. Missy, I think, was involved in that, and I think that she knows where we were supposed to go with it. And there might be something that's in the plans, but we're not doing until after, you know, uh, Peb does their deal or whatever, because I, I remember there was a change in the turn lanes from the three to two, um, but I don't know where that ever, I mean, like you said, I think that there might be something there, but we just didn't, didn't see it yet because it's maybe... In the process of yeah, so that's why I was asking. I don't. But, know. I mean, I think I'd she would probably know. Yes, I'd rather not meet with her just yeah. individually. I'd rather her give us an update. Well, she can give us an update at the next meeting. At the meeting, yeah. Can we do that? Sure. That's all Absolutely. I was like. I just thought about it tonight. Yeah. I was like, sure. what happened? Sure. I think, Mayor. I think we should keep in mind too that this is an emergency exit for it is. hurricanes, and once they get through that bottleneck, 
Swinton and Federal or Swinton no. to the ocean, they're going to want to try and get the traffic moving. So maybe that was a part of the reason why we didn't do a narrowing I have no for idea. another yeah. different. Yeah. So I'm sure. I, I, I remember a little bit of that. So no, up, no problem with an update. Anything else, Commissioner? Uh, that's all. All right, Vice Mayor, anything? Yes, I want the um, Vice Mayor, Deputy Vice Mayor, to be seated. I have nothing. Thank you. <laughs> now you're dating yourself. Only, only those old enough to know what you were saying understand that. Classic fans, cl fans of classic television. It's too funny. All right, so um, I, I just want to ask uh, my uh, colleagues if we can change the organizational meeting from that Thursday to Tuesday. We usually have to have it on Thursday because we have a meet, uh, uh, an election. We don't have an election this year. There's no reason, you know, why we couldn't do that unless there's a conflict. I'm what, date just is, hoping. what date is that? What time? It's the, th I don't know. Is the date is March 29th. Originally, right. it was scheduled for March 31st, so Thursday. Thursday. She's asking for March 29th, Tuesday. Yeah, right here. Just moving it back so we have it on a regular Tuesday meeting instead of a Thursday. That works Which for is me. normal cool. for us, yeah? yeah. Right, it kind of opens up the weekend for everybody, too. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, no, there's I no... The I already CRA the meeting is going to be, be on the 22nd? Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, not the 22nd, on the 29th. So we're just moving it two days earlier. No, I'm just saying the CRA meeting then is going to have to be on the 22nd. Okay. I believe it's scheduled for the 22nd now. Yeah. All right, very good. So we'll do that. That way we can have everything kind of scheduled together. The organizational meeting will therefore take place Tuesday, March 29th, 2022 at 4 o'clock p.m. Okay, and then the only other question that I had was um, the school, uh, the um, education board chair, Mitch Katz, came up and said something about that we would be meeting with the school district. Any news on that? And is there any is there is there any progress on yes that? so of course we talked about the meeting that my office will host with mr sanchez and others from the school district however the next education board meeting of the city of Derry beach will take place monday march 7th mm -hmm. of which we've invited leadership from the school district to be a part of that particular meeting and discussion of which i'll be there to offer introductory remarks and offer the guidance and direction from there so that's march 7th in addition to some of the administrative work my office is involved, for which my office is involved. Very good. That's it for me. This meet, with really this quick. meeting at their location, so. The education group for the city of Derry Beach will take place here, okay. actually in the conference room, or actually here in the city commission and They'll chamber. come to us, whoever wants to attend. Yes, ma'am. From the school district. Mayor. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Sorry. Um, we do the organizational meeting the following week. Because I'm looking at the charter. The charter says it's on or after the last Thursday in March. So in order to be in full compliance with the charter, can we do it on April 5th? Which is a regular meeting night, too. It's fine. We can do it. Yeah, we can just do it at, at, uh, sure. There's really nothing um, on the agenda this year other than the appointment of the If it's required by charter to do it, then, I mean, combine it then. Because so, it's right. going to be literally a 20-minute meeting. Right. Not even. So... <laughs> To so me, we, I just say we just do it when we're doing something else rather than ever having to ever come in for something. I mean, I understand it when we have, when we're introducing sure. new, you know, um, commissioners. That's a different story, but we're not doing that this time. Well, April 5th will be the regular meeting slash organizational Perfect. meeting. I would like you to vote on it, though, because typically we vote on our meeting days. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. 